gloom. Um, but welcome to this session looking at um, innovation in predictive techniques, assessment and evaluation. We're going to be talking about some innovative approaches to some very old and familiar questions um, over the course of, of the two sessions that we're running this morning and this afternoon. So questions like, is there anything there? What is it? Where is it? What's its current state of preservation? What's its significance? Is it at risk of harm? Can we enhance its significance? What's its potential to enhance our understanding of the past and answer our research questions? Who else needs to know about it? What should happen next? And that age old and perennial question that dogs us all in life as in archeology, span have I got in enough information to make a decision yet? In part one this morning, we're going to have a look at the contribution of metal detecting and consider how as a technique, um, we can better embed um, metal detecting into professional practice particularly when it comes to evaluation. Um, I'm delighted that we've got Keith Westcott here from the Institute of De Detectorists, who will be explaining a bit more about that for us, and particularly telling us why it's not all about metal. Um, we thought long and hard about including metal detecting in, in the, 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 uh, the, the title for this morning's session, um, but uh, I'll leave it to Keith to explain a little bit more about that. We also have a panel of experts with us this morning who will be sharing their perspectives on the benefits of incorporating detecting into the suite of tools that we use to assess and evaluate archaeological potential and significance. Um, linked to this, we've got the two, two separate sessions really, but, but they are linked and um, very much in theme. So this afternoon we'll be looking at new ways of assessing, mapping and quantifying archaeological potential with Sandy Kidd from the Greater London Archaeological Advisory Service. And we'll be looking at work to evaluate a very um, established methodology, trial trench evaluation with Richard Hyam, who is a PhD researcher at the University of Brighton. And I'll say a little bit more about their presentations when, when we introduce that session after lunch. But just before we kick off, um, I've got just a little bit of housekeeping to do. Um, today's session is being recorded and all the recordings will be available to festival um, innovation festival delegates as soon as possible after the session and you'll be able to access those through um, shared or scared I'm not quite sure how how that's meant to be pronounced but anyway the, 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 the means by which you joined us today um, we would ask you that all all um, delegates who aren't presenting keep their microphones on mute during the presentations if you're happy to keep your cameras on, that's great because it's always lovely to see faces and real people. But obviously we appreciate that some people will be joining us from all sorts of different locations. You may have stuff going on in the background um, and you might not wish to be, um, be seen. So um, yeah, feel free to either way, cameras on or off as you, as you prefer. We will have an opportunity for questions and discussion at the end of this session. We've got a good, a good long stop for discussion. Um, I think we'll keep questions to the end, but if you have a burning question, and particularly if, like me, you've got to that age where you need to write it down, otherwise it will, um, it'll disappear out of your memory, then please do put it in the chat, because I'll pick up questions in the chat as the presentations are, are, are going on, um, and make sure that we return to them in the discussion. Um, when we get to the Q&A and the discussion section, you can raise your virtual hand and then we'll invite you to unmute your microphones to, to ask the question. If you have any technical difficulties um, during the, the morning, then, then please do just put that in the chat and we'll pick that up and try and help. Um, I probably don't need to say this, but um, but it's, it's on my script, so I'll say it anyway. Um, we want, obviously, today to be a positive experience for everyone. Um, as with all the sessions um, in the Innovation Festival, we're welcoming discussion and debate, but we would ask that everybody shows respect, courtesy and consideration to everyone else here, um, particularly if we're, we're uh, disagreeing with each other. Um, and if anybody is concerned or has any concerns, then, then just let us let either myself or um, CIFA Events, who, who is my colleague Leanne, who's, who's looking after the, the admin side of things this morning, just let us know in the chat um, and we'll deal with that. There is a scheduled break and we will do our best to keep to, to time, but there is also quite a bit of flexibility in the schedule this morning, so um, we, can, we can play it by ear a little bit. 
So um, I think that's probably enough for me. If everyone's sitting comfortably, I'm going to ask the panel to introduce themselves to you. And I'm going to start with Keith, please, if you could just introduce yourself. Yes, good morning all. Uh, Keith Westcott from the Institute of Detectorists. And um, you'll hear all about me and what we're doing um, in a few minutes time. Thank you, Keith. Um, Tom, you're next on my list. Uh, yeah, I'm a um, <clears throat> metal detectorist. Um, I've been a hobby metal detectorist since 2005. Um, I then got involved with the, the PAS and recording. Um, started research into a type of medieval book and got that published with the Finds Research Group as one of their data sheets. And then got uh, involved with Keith and the Institute of Detectorists, um, which brought me to where I am now. Brilliant, thank you, Tom. Uh, ben, can I have you next? Yeah, my name is Ben Wallace. Uh, I'm an archaeologist at Warwickshire County Council. Um, I'm responsible for managing the uh, Warwickshire and Solihull historic environment records. Uh, and I'm also the chair of the Association of Local Government Archaeological Officers Historic Environment Record Committee, or ALGEO HER Committee for short. Um, and so my perspective is going to be very much one of um, from HERs and local authorities. Brilliant. Thanks, Ben. And Rachel, you're next. Hi, I'm Rachel Seeger-Smith. I work as an archaeologist for Wessex Archaeology in the role of finds manager. So I'm responsible for all finds processing for the company and um, run the specialist team. Brilliant. Thank you, Rachel. And last but not least, Toby. Hi, yeah, I'm Toby Catchpole. Um, I lead the heritage team at Gloucestershire County Council and I also represent Algeo on the Portable Antiquities Advisory Group, PARG, as it's known. Thank you very much. Thanks, Toby. Right. Um, on that note, then, I will hand over to Keith to tell us a little bit more about embedding detecting into professional practice, the DAPAS approach. Thanks, Keith. So good morning, everyone, and, and thank you for tuning in. Um, I say tuning in because uh, I came back on a flight last night and I was listening to a podcast and that was from, um, it was Rob Bryden and he was talking to Whispering Bob Harris and they were talking about being DJs and on the radio. And I thought, Crikey, that must be so hard to do. And yet here I am in, in a room on my own talking to a screen. So <laughs> hopefully I can uh, get us through the next 30 minutes. Now, um, back, it will be six years ago in uh, January, February, that, that I started trying to form um, or work on an initiative to form an institute of detectorists. Um, I come back. I come from a background of working within inst institutes in industry, and um, I was chair of British Standards for Heating, uh, and I represented the UK as principal expert in European standards, um, but also then in uh, other uh, institutes for plumbing and heating. Uh, and actually, when I started to think about education and metal detecting, it seemed to me that, that um, the institutes always sort of um, support, educate and, and, um, and have a sort of organisation that you can look to and look up to, to try and help with, um, in those instances, uh, within your career. And that's why I went for the, the um, to try and form an, an, an institute. Um, now, let me just take that off of the screen there. Um, so where we are at the moment is that the Institute of Detectress is formed as a community interest company. And the Detectress Foundation is asset linked to it. So you've got a 
notable incorporated organization asset locked with a community interest company uh, and really what that does it, it sort of enforces by law the fact that is, this is not for profit and that the profits get reinvested into the, the project to help and you know, what I really hope will happen in the future is that the, the Detectress Foundation the charitable part of it will be able to help um, fund particularly de defining, um, defining new sites which are found by Detectress because quite often you know a detectorist will find a site and doesn't really know what to do next and in fact the the, you know, the cost of something like a geophysical survey is um it's probably not possible well we, we'd love to be able to try and help um along those lines and then the um the institute the community interest company will be that the membership and educational side of the um uh, of this organization um no i we put on there that um uh, why is it um why it's not all about the metal and um there you've got me um holding a boar's tusk and that is very special to me uh, and it's not metal uh, and that sort of takes me on to the next slide So um, what does it mean to detect? Well, as you see on here, it's um, to notice something that is partially hidden or not clear or to discover something, especially using a special method. Well, um, we as the Institute of Detectorists, we want to attract those people which are really interested in everything when it comes to um, history, conservation, archaeology, and so we're interested in all material artefacts. And we were just as interested in, in, in flints and pots as we are to metal. Um, and if we can see that as dating evidence, then that gives us um, a, a chance to start to build this contextual landscape um, and realize why metal detecting if done properly and recorded properly and spatially can start to give us a much better um, understanding of our past. So um, the code of practice, well, that, um, you might recognize Tom there. Um, he, he's been the face of the code of practice for some time when it's been sent out to people. Um, but actually it's the code of practice which a huge motivation to me, um, but and probably not for the reasons you're thinking, because informing metal detectorists, um, and let's go on to saying detectorists, people are looking beyond just metal, um, there's not been any real great attempt to put on education on a, like a national program to sort of uh, explain best practice or even develop best practice. And I think these two, these two sort of paragraphs here say a lot um, in that if detecting takes place on pasture, be careful to ensure that no damage is done to the archaeological value of the land, including earthworks. Avoid damaging stratified archaeological deposits. That is to say that finds seem to be in place where they were deposited in antiquity and minimize any ground disturbance through the use of suitable tools. Now, we are talking to the 30 or so thousand detectorists out there and if they can get their heads around what this really means then they're doing well because in the last five and a half years I've really struggled uh, um, to, to understand this or understand a good way to actually um, to, to sort of move that forward in a way that people can really understand because when we're talking about minimize any ground disturbance I mean the, the, the tool of choice here we're talking about is usually a spade and actually, if you're digging down with a spade, the fact that you know that you're damaging stratified archaeological deposits isn't particularly easy. And um, so then, uh, you know, if you're detecting, what point are you actually damaging the archaeological value of the land uh, and indeed earthworks? So to, to me, the, the key to... Um, why we're going forward with the Institute of Detectorists, it's to say that these points that we're making here are really very, very important, obviously, but, but that actual communication, the dissemination back to um, hobbyists, um, it's so critical because 
you know, perhaps nothing turns a person off than you know, reading something which doesn't quite sort of um, explain or if there's no explanation behind it. So let, let me tell you very quickly about um, my past. Um, I, I started detecting in the 90s. Um, I, I was diving on shipwrecks and found it was too far to uh, to drive from the, the middle of England. Um, but my real interest was the actual history behind the wreck. And I thought, well, if I'm not going too far from home now, what can I do? And I started to get involved in uh, local history and um, and the idea of metal detecting came up. So to cut a very long story short, um, I went to see Lord and Lady Sane Seal at Broughton Castle and said, could I do some detecting here? And they said, we've had it detected before. We don't think there's anything there, but you're welcome to. And I said, well, I've got a, a different approach. I want to really do my research. I spend more probably time researching than um, detecting. And, um, and by the way, I don't want anything that I find. Um, whatever I found, whether it's treasure or whatever, it, it is yours. And um, that was the uh, agreement. And um, um, on the left hand, in fact, uh, you can see my cursor, I think. So wh where we've got the Broughton Castle here and the main crossing across the moat, what you'll see that back here on the uh, one side of it is um, a bridge which was knocked down um, 350 years ago or so. Uh, when I found that out, and this was back in the 90s um, through li libraries and such, I thought oh, that would be really interesting to look at the ancient roots from there. So um, I went out there and I found an incredibly interesting hoard of 16 silver coins. I took straight to Lord Say and Seal. And um, uh, we in, in the halfway through finding them, probably about seven, eight core coins in, we got in touch with um, Oxford Archaeology and the Acmolium to say, look, um, you know, some of these are a bit deep. What, what should we do about it? And um, but but following on from that, uh, it went to Crown Court um, to an inquest. Uh, and it was actually the very last one in a thousand years of, um, of common law treasure trove. Um, that was then deemed treasure trove, and um, then months after, the British Numismatic Society, uh, the, the journal, um, turned around and said, well, actually, some of those coins, we think, were actually Spanish coins minted in the Netherlands, which were brought over by Queen Henrietta Maria when she was sort of selling off the crown jewels. Um, and you're know, whizzing through this little story. The, the, the part of the idea of the story here is, is to try and change that narrative because whenever we're asked um, by the media about interesting finds, it's always about money. And uh, so it's so important that we can have really interesting historical stories to sort of promote what we're trying to do here. Um, it was in um, on display in the Ashmolean for over a decade, and they did attribute it to my find, which was really nice. Um, I went on then to um, thinking very deeply about a sarcophagus burial, um, because I didn't think that it was in context with a Roman road or a settlement. I felt it was there um, overlooking uh, um, a, a residence. So basically after a few months of thinking about this, I went out searching for it and um, not with a metal detector, just looking for uh, well, basic um, archeology span uh, or archeological techniques of landscape, um, topography and such. And um, and there was a, a most incredible Roman villa, and uh, I've shown you a scale on there because that that scale is actually the front of Buckingham Palace, so it gives you a feel for, for what it's looking like. Um, but but what is particularly interesting when um, quite often it, um, archaeologists will say that that metal detecting can be a destructive technique. Um, I, I think it, you know there's so many reasons why that can be the case. But but um, when we see that the actual tool of choice initially to look at this is um, a JCB by the archaeologists, I think well actually I probably took a lot of care with my my small spade <laughs> and trowel. What was so important, though, was the fact that we 
plotted the fines and the coin fines to give us that information when it comes to the possible phasing of the villa and i think this is absolutely critical for you know how we move moving forward because um, I know archaeologists will very often strip topsoils uh, without detecting, but, but if you look at the actual, um, how these, you know, the, all of that area was intensively detected, but what you've got there is, you know, if you take away the geophysics and magnetometry survey, you could pretty much tell that that was some form of courtyard villa that we would got there. So uh, one of the themes is the fact that the um, metal detecting for dating evidence um, is so critical. But when I say metal detecting, this is where I say, again, this isn't about metal detecting. It's about actually detecting anything or, or finding anything of, of relevance. So at the same time, um, interesting shards, so whether it's Samian ware or a coin, that's been treated exactly the same because you know, when so many detectorists are very knowledgeable and will always look at the non-metallic material. And um, that's something that we want to sort of um, encourage. Uh, now, when I say about spatial plotting here, um, I, I've got to say I made a real howler of a mistake on another site close to this on the Broughton Castle estate. Um, I, I went detecting there um, quite some years ago, and I put everything through the Port of Antiquities scheme, uh, so it was recorded, um, but, but I didn't spatially plot everything. And, and that's something I'll always re re regret. And in this instance, what you'll see um, on this drawing here is another instance where um, th there's been many coins um, actually, rather than plotted onto a drawing, they've been lumped together on a single GPS um, location on this. And, um, and of course, that's really what I did on this site. And it wasn't till I um, went to um, do my course at Oxford um, Metal Detecting, sorry, <laughs> Archaeology in Practice, um, that, that I realized that, you know, how important this side of things are and how many um, things which are in the principles and values of um, archaeology that we should think, be thinking about with. Um, uh, with, with metal detecting. And uh, I've put this bit on the side saying the random searching for casual losses or the targeting of archaeological sites. That's something which comes up time and time again. Uh, and that will be why our detectors are very much saying that they can't do any harm in what they're doing here because there's no relevance in their finds in the top soil. It's got no relevance to the archaeology be below that. And of course, you've seen in the slide before how we are trying to show the opposite, that it is really important that the, um, that the, spatial, the spatial plotting is there, even though it's on a plough plow soil. Um, down in the right hand corner, um, I, I've put something else in there, which is when I was doing my uh, research at Swindon on the aerial archives to see whether the villa had ever been discovered, um, this is where I found some incredible sites. And I'd go to the landowners and I'd say to them, do you, do you realise that these are um, uh, archaeological features on your land? And in most cases, in fact, all cases, actually, they had no idea that they were there. But of course, when the detectors are saying this is random searching out, out there that's very not much not the case now um they're very very clued up of uh, anything from lidar to sites which will put in a postcode and it will give you all of this information so you can buy a metal detector one day the next day you can be targeting archaeological sites which have never been um defined or um or, or even investigated apart from that that photo move on so we, um, you know, the first thing I thought that we needed to do is to get some education out there because, as I say, there's never been any education um, offered to detectors. So um, working with um, the University of Oxford, I, I put on this course, uh, Metal Detecting for Archaeological Projects, as an introduction. And it had um, many different issues that we've got to think of as a detectorist, um, you know, assisting archaeologists. Um, but, but actually, one thing which is really 
really quite crucial is, is that part of this talked about the, um, the stratigraphy and the matrix. And actually, as you can see up there, that, that um, Ed Harris wrote to me uh, and um, to commend our efforts uh, of trying to teach um, the, the uh, basics of the matrix to um, detectorists. And there's have been a few people outside of the detecting world who said, oh, that's a, you know, what, what on earth do detectorists need to know that for? But actually, it's so crucial that, that when you think of, um, you know, you're finding a, I don't know, Edward II long cross silver penny, and that's below a Cistercius. And you know, what the devil's going on? Because you know, that isn't logical. But actually, when we see the, the actual work that archaeologists have to do to try and define and understand a site, which can be affected over um, centuries of, uh, of, of building. Um, and um, so then that makes you think a little bit deeper about the the tool you're using as a spade and digging down. And I think um, the CBA um, those years ago in the stock campaign um, sent out this little um, uh, image of metal detecting through all of the different sort of stratified um, deposits to get down to something which was of no interest at all. And why on earth you do want to sort of damage your way through the archaeological uh, record there. And, um, and actually, I think that was a really great um, little image there, and it's something that we need to do more of because um, it's one thing saying that detectorists don't think clearly about that, but it's another thing to think they've never had an opportunity to consider it in many cases because there hasn't been that sort of form of education out there to, to sort of discuss it. So we're really uh, proud that this went on then to become um, the the, uh, the winner of the 2019 Archaeological Training Forum Awards. So we're extremely proud to think that um, not only could we put on a course like this at the University of Oxford, that it went on then to, I think it got 95% in the overall ratings for people who attended. It was um, fully booked for 41 people and we could have um, booked it time and time again. So so there's a real interest out there from people who would like to attend these types of courses. Um, Historic England then very kindly, or, or very kindly, I don't know if that's the, the, the right word, but we ended up getting um, some funding to do uh, a feasibility study. And if you can see all of the people there um, in, involved, we had every major um, body organisation, institute, um, government agency across the UK and also into Ireland involved in this project. And I think it's quite important to see how um, both um, Fame and Algeo um, supported this. And in fact, actually, so we had this, these sorts of um, supporting references uh, drawn up by then everyone on there. So, um, so yeah, there's a huge amount of support for what we're trying to do. Um, where else in the world is this sort of work happening? Not, not that many, actually, when it comes to um, building bridges between archaeologists and detectorists. Um, but I spent two weeks over in Virginia on the um, President James Madison estate, you know, fourth president and father of the Constitution. Uh, and the work there we were doing was, you know, really the only way of being able to define where the enslaved quarters were through nails and being able to determine the initial sort of rose-headed wrought nail compared to modern machined ones. But that's gone on to, um, if you look at the, um, the image on, on the right hand side, the hot spots here, and in that hot spot you've got the red hot spot, the, the, the blue for not many nails, and the in-between, and that in-between there, which I'm highlighting with my um, cursor there, actually gave the archaeologists a chance to look at that area as a possible new building. Now, be bearing in mind that this is actually the, the, the childhood hall, home of George Washington at Follin Farm. You know, that's his crucial work um, uh, being done by detectorists working with archaeologists. So the DAPAS approach, Again, you know, the, the, the sort of principles behind it um, are, are very sort of straightforward 
principles of extensive and intensive surveys. And then normally, if you look at an intensive um, gridded survey, that, that's not so easy to work with um, a, a, as a detectorist. But, but, but we can then try and um, put our own um, idea onto this. And um, so we use a grid, which is 20 by 10. And that's all done with um, with cables or ropes, which, which are all non-metallic, even the, the, the spliced ends are non-metallic. Uh, and it means you can very, very quickly do an intensive search over 200 square metres where you're doing pretty much 100% coverage of that area. And um, and the hardest thing for detectorists at all times is being able to, when you're concentrating at the floor, is, is actually making sure you're not going offline. So the idea of having these, um, the, these two meter um, uh, sweep areas, then we can be really very accurate really in this. So um, up in the top left corner, you'll see one that we did on a battlefield some years ago. And um, the, the, the partial side, when we're talking about partial, we're talking about the transects and, and that can be anything from say, 20 meters down to five meters um, on a sampling um, basis. Um, but, but there are areas like uh, in particular, the geophysics had brought out that there was some interest and we needed to do a much closer intensive survey over there. Um, you know, could that be a building which was there at the time of the war um, or the battle? Uh, you know, has that got some significance to the site? Uh, you know, there, there's a real reason, I think, that um, there, there must be times where we're moving away from that sample process of, say, a five or ten metre transect and thinking, no, we need to do a real detailed search of that area. Um, in fact, down in the right, um, bottom right hand corner uh, on that really muddy site, that was HS2. And, and in that instance, we were doing 20 metre transects there, but we were working with um, archaeologists doing geochemistry surveys. So these were blank areas which are going to be very difficult to find through geophysics. So the ge um, geochemistry approach, but also metal detecting and field walking, it really becomes a great sort of partnership to, um, to to look into try and find things like Anglo-Saxon sites, which will be very difficult um, to, to find. Also in the, in the middle there, you'll see our um, bagging uh, approach. Uh, one thing uh, that I find very difficult working on different archaeological sites is when we're told not to dig the find. And be because we are so focused in to that target and sound uh, and, and being able to then um, locate exactly where it is without damaging it. I mean, obviously, this is topsoil we're talking about. We're not going into subsoils. We're just keeping into that zone that quite often are stripped by archaeologists. So in that instance, what we would do, we would peg it but we would tag it as well. And the reason for the tagging is that quite often that the actual, um, that the find itself may want to be retrieved by the um, small find specialists for the project before it's had a chance to be GPSed in. So this allows you to, 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 you know, to actually locate the find to carefully extract it, to put it into a bag um, and have that bag taken away um, two or three hours later before the GPS comes in later in the day search. It gives you that flexibility. And of course that means that, that we will be putting information on the tag as well as on the bag. And, um, and then when it's been geolocated, the, the information will all tie up at the end of the day. Um, and you can see here where we uh, had that intensive approach and the sort of um, spread of finds that, that we found there. But uh, it comes down to the um, do we, what, what do we actually want to um, what, what do we want to, to look for on that particular day? Um, and I can't think of the word for it and it will come back to me in a minute. I always forget this word, which is so an, a, annoying. Um, and, uh, and on that point, I'll move on to the next screen. So really, where, where are we with this? And you see lots of photographs of me there, actually, because there's, um, and until we open up for membership, 
um, that there are a lot of people which are, are, are not happy about the fact we're trying to bring an edu edu educational approach to metal detecting. So um, it's quite easy for me to be there because I'm quite used to the sort of stick that I get from this. Um, but, but if you look up on the left hand side there at the top where we talk about low volume spoil, well, there's nothing worse than having piled up spoil where the, the surface area to volume mean it is like a needle in the haystack. So the, the more that that can be leveled out, but, but actually have your topsoil go out first and then your um, subsoils closer to the actual um, trench means that we've got some idea of uh, whether it's come from topsoil or subsoil. Um, and then below it shows um, in uh, construction work where everything's non-metallic because there's nothing worse than working around steel toe caps in a trench. Um, so we are particularly um, non-metallic there. Um, then we go into this, um, the, the, the detailed approach, as you can say in the middle there, that again is all non-metallic. Now that might sound obvious, but the sites I've been on to where all of the posts, the flagging, the, the, the setting out of small transects are all done with metal flags, all sorts, and it drives us crazy when we were trying to uh, make some sense of um, in fact, it, there was a project I was um, involved in uh, only a few weeks ago where the actual find was more or less directly under um, a, a stake which would have been metal and meant that we wouldn't have found it. Um, up in the top there, we, we're talking about the fact that, that this resource of, of, of detectress, um, we, we want to be out there to work and assist alongside and for archaeologists. So there, there's this resource and a bank of, of, of uh, ed, people who have been educated to archaeological principles and values. And then um, again, you know, if there is uh, mechanical excavation going on, we, we can then... Um, intensively survey before the actual bucket goes in and then between each time that that bucket's brought back um, and of course then in the trench as well being able to locate um, potential non-ferrous um, metals before we get down on top of them. So um, where are we now? Well, we're really, really hoping that Historic England uh, are going to fund uh, our next step, which is then opening up to membership and being then able to um, start our educational process of putting together interesting um, videos and educational talks. But but things which are done in a really interesting in in. Um, an, an interesting way, um, but you know, we're desperate for support from the heritage sector and archaeologists, and there, there will be um, a, like a Friends of the Institute membership there, very low cost Friends of the uh, where, where it would be fantastic to get the support of heritage professionals and archaeologists, but also then groups and um, commercial archaeology um, uh, companies would be great if they could become members as well and help us along here because along the way unfortunately there are a percentage of the 30 odd thousand detectors out there which are really dead against us doing this and again when they say that they're out there randomly searching for casual losses basically what they don't want to show or us to show is actually you know we can do a lot of damage by going out there and and just digging for finds which are then becoming objects with no context and you know just preventing the general community, the archaeological community, but, but also the local community, history societies, community archaeologists, all being able to have that knowledge of what was found and where it was found to build that contextual landscape. So we're really keen to be working more, um, more and have that community engagement. But um, when we did this work initially, um, we got some really great support, but then the ones which wanted to stop it seeded so many sort of untruths out there. And before we know it, um, you know, if we look at the bottom there about supporting the idea of, um, uh, of Institute of Detectress, we had a strongly disagree there. And these were people who come in very late in the day who'd been told to go over there and get in, in contact. So um, there we are. That's, uh, 
this is where I'm going to finish my talk. And um, again, I, I would like to sort of stress how important it is that, that we can start to think and develop this DAPAS approach. We don't want to reinvent any wheels out there. We've been talking to the uh, Battlefields Trust recently as well. We want to be able to try and say um, um, and think, well, if, if we can find a consistent approach to this, we can also then try and encourage those um, um, hobbies detectorists, which, which perhaps might not want to go out and work on archaeological sites, but they may want to actually bring a more systematic approach to what they do. And that gives us a chance to, um, to come up with parts of this DAPAS approach, which can work well for um, for detectorists, but but also um, it, it it starts much younger trying to get this message across. And um, I've got this photograph there. I do lots of talks to all, all sorts of uh, different groups. This was 250 um, 16 to 17 year old boys at the Royal Grammar School Guildford, uh, and again trying to. Um, you know, take this idea about treasure and valuations out of it uh, and replace it with, with good, strong motives around um, history uh, uh, and interesting stories. And um, then below, we've got our talks with the um, police and community police. Um, uh, and there's a lot of work I think we can do to try and, um, to, you know, to, to uh, su support um, her heritage crime units and such and uh, also I show my little um, avatar there for time team um, time teams watched by many detectorists and um, and our work with time team at the moment really gives us an opportunity for everybody to see the benefits of of doing things um, uh, properly so uh, again I will finish off with um, just just this request them uh, what you know, please please uh, support us you know, help us if you've got archaeological projects that we can be involved in, please get us in, involved so, so that we can develop this over the coming months. And we, we know we haven't got the answer for it, but we want to work with everybody to build that. So, thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Keith. Um, and and just say that um, I know that the, the amount of... Uh, um, opposition and 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 also abuse that you've come in for over the, the 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 years you've been trying to get this up and running has been um has been considerable um and and i think your your um willingness to keep going in the face of that um has, has been really quite inspirational so um it's, it's really great to to have you here this morning um and and as as you know i'm really keen from cifa's perspective to look at the ways that we can that we can integrate metal detecting as a technique within our standards and guidance and see it as another specialist area of, of, of our ecological practice, another, another tool that we can incorporate into the, the, the suite of, of techniques that we use um, with, this, with the specialists um, to, to undertake that. Um, I'm going to, as I said at the beginning in the introduction, we can take, um, we will take questions in the discussion session after the break, but I'm keen to go to our panel now actually and get some perspectives from you. Um, and um, we've not really set you up with any any particular um, angles to respond from, but um, I might go to, to Rachel first actually, um, and, but perhaps ask you all to think a little bit about about your thoughts really on the frequency and use of metal detecting as part of the, the suite of techniques and, and what the benefits and barriers are from your perspective. But, but, but Rachel, would you like to, to chip in at this point? Okay. Well, from someone sitting within a large commercial organization, I can definitely see the quantity of metal finds go through the roof on projects where we have a consistent use of metal detectors. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's astonishing from sometimes nothing on Roman and medieval sites where you would at least expect a tractor part to have come back accidentally. There's nothing in the finds trays. And over the recent years, we have seen a huge increase in the number of WSIs that have a paragraph saying, in one way or another, metal detectors will be used as part of your 
techniques on this site. And that's a bit hit and miss, shall we say. There is quite often the inclusion of the phrase, where appropriate, which is one of those very, very useful phrases, but it's also a great get out clause because it's very easy to say, well, it wasn't appropriate here. And even for example, if you are investigating the topsoil over a mesolithic site, there may well be something later in it that perhaps you are machining off if you don't bother looking. Um, however, archeological staff are not generally trained in the use of metal detectors. And let's face it, in anybody's hands, anything, if it's not used correctly from a trowel to a 360 excavator can do one hell of a lot of damage. And similarly, an untrained archeologist waving a metal detector around is unlikely to be entirely successful, shall we say. So just as Keith is rightly pointing out, there is a huge need to educate people keen on metal detecting for their own interest. I feel we also need to educate our own people to use them well and accurately. Seeing Keith and his teams on the time teams this last two years has been very educational um, because I can see how it works properly. Personally, in the years when I ran my own field projects, I was used to um, being involved with local metal detector users, most of whom were great. We had a fantastic relationship. They helped us greatly um, on two major infrastructure projects in Kent. Wessex Archaeology worked with one particular individual who actually put in more hours on that site than any of the field team. And at points there were over a hundred of them. And Roger put in more hours overall. Um, again, increasingly, we actually have a huge problem getting extra boots on the ground. We would quite often like to have more involvement with local individuals, local groups using metal detectors, but we can't easily A, find them. We normally go through the PAS scheme or local museum connections for any of our non-commercial community projects and get people involved in those. But there is no fail safe way of knowing whether you've got good responsible users. Again, we've been lucky, we have had the, that contact, we haven't had a problem. But I do remember one individual who um, wasn't welcome on the particular site that day because we'd already got a group of local people working. Um, he wasn't prepared to share or play the game with them. And the only way I could prevent him causing merry hell was to keep my steel toe capped boot under his machine. But you know, one individual over 20, 30 years is nothing. Most people are great and we can develop really good working relationships. However, on the, again, big infrastructure projects, it can be quite difficult even to swap our own staff in and out. I can see that very quickly archeological companies will be employing specialist metal detector users because the requirement is now so much greater. Um, and I think I rejoice in that day. But at the moment, things like all the health and safety inductions, CS, need for CSCS cards, um, safety critical medicals that the staff have to go to before they're allowed on the site, um, periodic drug testing, etc., all of which are commonplace on these bigger projects make more casual involvement difficult. We can't even swap our own staff if one is sick sometimes. Um, so I think we've got a lot of education to do both 
it, within both groups. And um, that's why I agreed to take part in this session um, because I was asking Keith whether he might just be able to help us with our staff training. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Rachel, for that. That's that's really really helpful. Um I'll go to, to Toby next, actually, if I may. Um Toby, just from from, from a um, Rachel was mentioning about about reference to metal detecting in WSIs from, from a local government perspective and advisory perspective, how 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 common is that in, in, in your experience and, and, and what are the benefits and, and I'm, 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 att I'm attempting to find out to be perfectly honest with you. Um I mean um Keith sent us the um his DAPAS specification um for sort of general algeo comments. Um, I mean, the reason I volunteered to go on to the Portable Antiquities Advisory Group was because I've got a very low level of knowledge and want to know more. Um, and I have been thinking about this and trying to find out if there's any guidance or been much discussion on what, how we should be using metal detectors on sites. And I don't think there is any, unless I've missed it because I've been too busy. Um, personally, we tend to ask for metal detecting if we've got good reason to think there might be some um, Saxon burials or on or near any of our registered battlefields, but it's fairly ad hoc. And I don't ask for a detailed specification from the contractors, what they do. So it was very interesting to hear what um, Rachel had to say. Um, and it pretty much concurs with my understanding. Um, I have asked people that are now our GAO members that used to be involved with PASS, um, I've asked people in East Anglia for some comments as well, um, because they have so many Saxon cemeteries. I think it's pretty much routine in Suffolk and Norfolk to ask for metal detecting surveys, but exactly what they ask for and what they don't get. Um, At one time I'm in not Norfolk, sure. it, sorry. At one time in Norfolk, it was apparently mandatory. Yeah, that's my understanding. So I, I might have to have a word with Johnny Percival as well. Um, I'm going to think from from a. Per I haven't had comments back from everybody. Some there are people out there that know more about it than I do. But um, I'd say I need best practice guidance for what I should be asking for as well. Um, and I've been around quite a long time now. And if I've not never seen anything, I should imagine anybody new has seen less. Um, I, mean, I think it's very good that we're having a session to discuss how we can make best use of metal detectors because it is a long overdue discussion to have from our point of view, because obviously we always veer off when we start talking about metal detecting into the illicit use of metal detecting. Um, hopefully we won't get onto that today. If people want to talk about that, they should watch um, Mark Harrison's paper from yes uh, day before yesterday, which was absolutely excellent. Um, and we do have some comments on the DAPAS as it now exists, or I have some comments, I'm waiting for other ones. And they, they mostly relate to, I think that the DAPAS is currently written, it sort of makes the assumption that it's being done in conjunction with an archeological survey done by professional archeologists, because it doesn't mention getting reports to the HER or how the archiving is going to be done, how the finds are going to be conserved, um, et cetera, et cetera. Which obviously, if the next stage for the uh, institute is to make recommendations for detectorists doing their own research. You know, there, there are some excellent examples out there, the Portable Antiquities annual meetings, which unfortunately not that many people know about, I don't think. <laughs> They've had some demonstrations of some excellent work over the years. But um, yeah, I think that any guidance for that sort of research would need to be a hell of a lot more detailed. Um, I think that was pretty much what I wanted to say, really. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Toby. Um, Tom, did you want to, to come in now? Yeah. Uh, morning, all. Um, really, following on from what a lot of what Keith said is, as a metal detectorist myself, um, I'm relatively new to metal detection. 2005 is it's relatively new for a lot of metal detectorists. Um, I think the, the the main issue I've seen is that the majority of metal detectors do not start out um, working on archaeological projects. So that 
Metal detectorists are hobbyists. They go out. Um, they basically create their own rules of how they do things. They do work out their own uh, survey techniques, if they have any. Um, a lot of it is just random. And there really isn't a lot of structure. The PAS brought in a degree of structure uh, when that um, uh, came about. And the metal detectorists that signed up to that um, were, to some extent, given a little bit of steerage in that they were recording GPS uh, to um, 10 or 12 figures if they could. They were recording um, soil types that they were in, cultivation types. But at the end of the day, there were, there were individual finds being recorded onto a database, and there wasn't an awful lot more metadata with that, with those finds. Um, myself, I, um, because I have an academic background, but not in archaeology, I was frustrated in that um, I didn't have any steerage on how I should be doing this when I first started metal detector. You know, how <laughs> um, I was basically had a metal detector and got permission to go out and, and detect. Um, it was down to me as to how I did that. Um, I got a lot more steerage once I got involved heavily with the Portable Antiquity Scheme and started speaking to the archaeologists there. And I was given a little bit of steerage as to how I should do, possibly survey my own fields. I could um, grid them out and, and do that. I then, at that point, was looking for more. Um, Keith came along <laughs> and um, I saw his um, course that he was going to be holding up in, in Oxford in 2018, um, which was the um, Metal Detecting for Archaeological Projects. I attended that and that was a real item because that was the first time I'd really seen any archaeological um, uh, standards, if you like, how they could be applied to what I'm doing with the metal detector. Um, and from then on, it really is um, looking at what metal detecting can offer on archaeological sites. Um, I think on my own experience, when I've done a couple of um, projects, archaeological projects as a metal detectorist, I've been pointed to the spoil heat and said, go and detect that. Not been told how to do it, just go over there and detect it and see what you can find. <laughs> and again, frustration because I naively possibly um, expected to be given steerage, told, you know, to have protocols in place that I could work to, but they weren't there. They weren't there. Um, and that is definitely something that is lacking and that we can uh, work towards. Um, I think the problem with the teaching um, people to use a metal detector from scratch is that, like any piece of technical equipment, they take an awful long time to learn. And the majority of metal detectors that know their machines have been operating them for years, decades in some cases, and they know their machines very well. Um, but because of that, again, the majority of people who are at that stage did not start or did not um, start their metal detecting careers with anything to do with archaeology. It was purely out of the hobby. Um, I said we now, it, if we work on archaeological projects, there has to be something in place that gives us a structured methodology to work in different situations. Um, and also to be able to produce records uh, and reports to um, accepted standards. Um, and that is something that I would certainly welcome, absolutely. Um, it would give me, if I'm working on specific projects with archaeologists, you need, you need that, you need something in place that you're not just wondering about my spoiling. <laughs> um, having said that, um, you know that that that's that's for both parties. It's not just for the metal detectors. The archaeologists need 
to know that we are working to um, standards um, and that for me is, is about where we are and I think the other side of things as well is on the research side of things when I when I was um, researching for my um, science research group data sheet on my on, on the medical book that I researched I found it incredibly difficult to find anything other than I use the PAS database as my primary source. Um, but because I hadn't come through um, the, uh, the academic, the archaeological, archaeological academic side of things, I found it very difficult to find out where else to go to look for um, information for researching. And, and I think that's maybe something else that, that um, uh, as a metal detectorist, if we're going to do this, it, it, open up the, um, if you like, information as to where we can actually look for for um, records other than the PAS, because again, as metal detectors, we are pretty much pointing to the PAS and nothing else. Um, so that's about it, I think for me, um, really, it's all just um, any, every, anything that will improve my um, metal detecting and contribution is very much welcome. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Um, and I'll move over to um, to Ben. Um, was there anything that you wanted to, to add from your perspective? The, <clears throat> yeah, there are a few points based on what people have said so far. But I think from from purely the HGR point of view, the, the, the most valuable thing for us is the information, the, the information about the site, the information about the finds. And and that's really the key for it for us. So if we don't have that information, if that information isn't transferred in some way, if that information isn't recorded in, in as good a way as possible, we question what's the point of doing it at all. You know, you know, it, it shouldn't just be about going out, you know, having a hobby, going out on a site professionally, recording something and say, I found something. It should be about what does that mean? What's the value of it? How does it fit into a research agenda? How do you put it all together with the rest of the site? And then that information transferring into the best place possible. Um, and yeah, and as an information source, then we as HERs can provide valuable information back out to professional metal detectorists and to those metal detectorists interested um, in, in all other spheres as well. And a lot of that information is made publicly available. Um, I th one, one of the interesting things that was brought up was about metal detectorists within sort of, you know, sites and when they're done through the planning process and through archaeological companies and, and in Warwickshire we've got a member of staff in in archaeology Warwickshire who who is a metal detectorist and has had a, got a, a lot of experience in metal detecting um, and I was just thinking uh, about this now recently they've trained themselves on using drones and they've purchased a drone and within a matter of a few years they've got drone licenses they know effectively how to use a drone on a site. They can do all of these amazing things with using drones. You could equally do the same <clears throat> for detecting. You could train archeologists um, to be extremely competent metal detectorists and they can have the equipment as well. <clears throat> and I was thinking maybe the way we should be looking at this is from all the different angles. Mm. We need to ensure that we have the, you know, the correct briefs, the correct WSIs with really good expectations and clear guidance on what to happen. We need to have really good reporting at the very other end. Yeah, so that that, that information, that really valuable information isn't lost and it actually goes to the right place. And that means using things like OASIS and, and actually having specialist metal detecting reports and finds processing and analysis and reports by specialists. <clears throat> and then I think in between, we need a variety of people who've got those skills and they, should be, I think in the chat we're saying, you know, professionals should be rightly paid. And if somebody comes in and they have that professional skill, they should be paid for that work that they're doing and doing it to a high standard. And that could be within an archaeological team on a site, or it could be um, consultants, contractors brought in. Um, and, and, and we've got to be looking at it all the different angles and bringing it together. I think if we just tackle one of them, 
i.e. a standard or ensure we have everything as a consistent brief, we're not dealing with the rest of the issue, which is do we have enough professional meta detectorists? Do we have the right understanding of what they should be doing? Do we have a reporting mechanism? Um, one of the other things that, that I think we, we've got, we, we, we do need to, to consider is the, the other side of metal detecting, the dark side of metal detecting. Ironically, as much as we would have a metal detectorist on site, metal detecting in a professional capacity, we have fencing and security guards protecting it so that at night it's not illegally night hawked. So the, the, the metal detecting is seen as, as an asset and a danger at the same time. Now that's really unusual for every other aspect of archaeology. You don't expect somebody to, to go on the site and start looking for archaeological features and removing a piece of pot or doing a bit of field walking at night. It's it's only you get that with metal detecting, and that's 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 an issue for this discussion. It's an issue for this profession, and and so I think we we need to look at that as well at some point. How we 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 put that together and deal with it. Thanks, thanks, Ben. Uh, some 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 really good points there, and I think I think um, Keith and Tom, you've 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 come across the the dark side of metal detecting, and and that's some of the the pushback to, to setting up the Institute of Detectorists that you've you've encountered, and maybe um, we can explore that in a little bit more detail. Um, is is this, do you want to chip in now, or should we bring that back after the, the break? Well, I, um, I would like to just add that um, it's been very difficult for me as a detectorist who wants to um, explore and understand the landscapes around me. You know, I, I've brought in um, geophysics to look at features where we found um, uh, an Iron Age farmstead settlement with a couple of um, stone roundhouses. Um, that's within view of my house and I, I got up on a... Um, uh, on a, it was actually New, New Year's Day morning to look and see a metal detecting rally going over the top of it um, before we've had a chance to go out there and actually um, do our proper survey for uh, all our artefacts. Um, what one of the problems being is that because I'm a de detectress, I can't um, easily get on to getting the information from the Portable Antiquity Scheme because uh, it's there for others um, to have that information and not necessarily detect detectorists to have that information because of the fact, you know, as you quite rightly say, that the biggest fear of a detectorist is another detectorist. Uh, and um, uh, and that, that is this odd hobby where um, people are not happy about giving the right information in, in case another detectorist finds it. So it, all in all, it is a very difficult um, issue. Um, and I think that all of the work which goes into the Portable Antiquities Scheme, um, there must be ways that detectorists can be brought in to be part of that. I mean, Tom's done some great work over the years. And, um, but, but we do need to um, have that engagement if detectors are expected to know and understand. I mean, another good example of, of knowing and understanding is that we're, we're often saying, you know, please don't um, dig into the subsoil to an in-situ find. So we're, we're doing better now, I think, in the hobby that people will stop and, um, and get archaeologists in. Um, but you don't always hear too much about what the archaeologist has actually learnt and understood from, um, from that excavation. And, um, and I think that's so important that, that we don't, we shouldn't have a, a situation where detectors go so far and then anything beyond that is, you know, that, that's to the professionals, to the uh, academics, to the researchers. And there must be some bridging of this as well to try and you know, m m make a, a, a more pal palatable approach, I think. I think hmm. one of the problems there is sort of that even when um, the archaeologists get involved, there is still only a tiny keyhole excavated, isn't there? Well, there so should be. We still don't know the answer to the main question like the last time team at Winfrith, yes, the grave was excavated, but we still didn't know whether it was part of a cemetery or not. Mm. Yes, so I... even with archaeological involvement, we still don't know enough. But th That's this, the this will be true of 
of a lot of archaeology and a lot of archaeological sites is we're only really <laughs> touching the, the surface of what what the the answer to the story is it's just one mm. piece of the puzzle isn't it um and and mo a lot of us in in the archaeological profession would prefer to keep things in situ where possible and to refrain from destroying the the the, the archaeology um if if that if that is an option and 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 that means that you you can't get the answers you always need and and in some ways you know those of us involved in develop any development work any development control work or or, or or work of that nature have the opportunity to look at our large areas of sites because they are going to destroy a whole huge massive amount of fields mm. um or, or an urban area and they're going to completely destroy it down to five ten meters of depth so you actually do have that really odd opportunity of following everything to the edge mm. and and that's actually a little bit unusual if you're if you've made an uh, uh, you know a a, a a, a site find as a find spot just in one area you wouldn't expect to open up the excavation for the whole field you yeah. know um so yeah it's going to be a frustrating it's always I, going to be frustrating i feel yeah. i think you're right uh, but in future years i think another session should be entitled is P preservation in situ actually possible because we now know it isn't <laughs> yeah it's it's, it's, it's it's not about that. It's, it's, it's about the, a, a, a preference, isn't it? It's like you know um, that. That, but yes, the preservation issue is a different topic of, of discussion. But that's the answer to the. I think that if the metal detectors are looking for a, a bigger answer to the story, it's because it's it's just not possible. The the, the bigger answer is is not going to be there in most cases. Well, per perhaps we can um, bring that up in the to start off the second half. I think <laughs> yeah, maybe that's a question to mull over. Um, while we just go and have a quick break. So if we can come back at um, about 25 past uh, 11 um, and um, yeah, we can mull over um, preservation in situ and other thorny questions like that. Well, I, th um, I think possibly that's for next year's. Next year's session. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, it's, it's a big elephant in the room these days, really. Yeah, it's it's it's, uh, it's certainly something um, that we expect will come up when looking at um, potentially a, a, a review of CFA's code of conduct coming up over the next the next um, year or so, and and uh, uh, there'll be some issues I think around those principles that we might want to 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 pick up and delve into a bit more a bit more deeply I think. Um, but yeah, that's, that's you're right. That's a, a question for another day. So we'll come back at um, 25 past 11 if we can. And thanks very much to Keith and the panel for contributions so far. There are some questions in the chat and, and we'll pick those up after the break. Thanks very much. And here. Brilliant. OK, well, I think we'll we'll assume that that uh, um, that most people are back now. Um, thanks everyone for contributions so far this morning. There's a few um, a few interesting issues that have come up um, in the discussion that we that we might um, that we might pick up on in this this um, last uh, session of discussion and, and debate. But I think I will start by just throwing open the floor to any questions. I know there were some in the chat, but if there are Anybody posted a question in the chat and would like to ask it in person, please do put your hand up, um, your virtual hand, if you if you can do that. Otherwise, I will um, I will go to the chat and and ask them on your behalf. But any any questions from from the floor, as it were, at this point? Uh, Perry, do you want to ask something? Morning, Kate. Hi, hi, Perry. <laughs> I'll put a note to you in the chat anyway. I uh, hope my sound's okay. The connection's not very good. Yeah, we can um, hear you. It, it, it's an observation I'd like to make because I found this morning really, really helpful. And thanks particularly to Keith. It's been an eye opener. But you know, Kate's heard me say this before. Some of you may have heard me say it before as well. I work in places where most of the work is done by community groups. And not often related to planning or in any way like that. It's depending very much on archaeologists or so small units, individuals, not like Wessex or Oxford or anybody else. And 
the one thing I would say is we're having a great conversation here, but who's getting the message out to those groups about what to expect from your archaeologist if they use metal detector risk? Because we do. And it is this, it is swanning over the, uh, over the uh, spoil heap. That's about it. And if I look across the groups I've worked with in Cumbria, North Yorkshire, County Durham, and Northumberland, that's pretty much the picture. And this is a CIFA problem as well as a problem of the discussion we're having now. How do you get the message out to those groups about what to expect from your archaeologist? I'd be delighted if, if Keith would come and talk to our groups and to CPA Yorkshire and see if we can spread the message. Mm -hmm. But this, this has got to be demand led as well as being top down, determined by the organisation of large groups like Wessex or Oxford, or by CIFA, making sure that those people who choose to join CIFA observe these regulations, rules and practices. Question is for you all, how are you going to make sure through CIFA this is demand led and all those groups scattered around the country who at the moment simply don't have any affiliation with CIFA do what Keith suggests, which I think is brilliant. Thank you. Can I answer that, uh, Kate? Yeah, yeah. Uh, go ahead. Good. Well, the, you know, the, the key thing about the Institute of Detectress uh, and the Detectress Foundation uh, as a sort of cha charitable and non-profit-led approach is that um, this is going to be for all stakeholders. So it... it it isn't for hobbyist detectorists on their own. It isn't for people who just want to be involved in archaeological projects. It's not actually just for people who want to do that. It's for landowners. Um, it, it's for um, anyone who is a, a form of stakeholder um, who is affected really by metal detecting, whether they detect or, or, or not. So certainly um, community archaeology is somewhere where we think we could make um, a, a real great difference. And um, I do lots of talks to history societies. And what I often see happening out there is that um, th there's a, a bit of sort of collaboration or communication between community archeologists um, who quite often attend historical society meetings and such. But then in a field, two miles away is a group of 100 detectorists who are so insular, they're so, you know, they never, um, they, no, no, that's not the right word, they never. Um, some will actually try and, um, and communicate with the local community. Others just do their bit and go. Uh, and um, so I think it's so uh, um, important that the Institute reaches out through community archeology, span through historical societies, through metal detecting groups to try and bring everyone together. So, um, so what one of my real fears has been is the fact that, that detectorists are actually now targeting archeological sites which have not been even walked over by an archeologist because they've just been defined through aerial photography and such. And, um, and the farmer themselves don't even know that they have their, these archeological sites on their land. Yeah, I, I think um, <coughs> the more we work together on that, the more that if a detectorist goes out there, he can see that um, you know, what he finds is of interest to every, everyone else and that they could be working then with the community archaeologists. So I think the CBA, you know, we, we hope to be working on, um, on a project with the CBA to sort of facilitate this. And it will be all about um, that, that information, the, the spread of information. And I'm hoping that if we do this Friends of the Institute membership as well, that we do bring in other stakeholders underneath those names as well to try and um, help. But yes, I certainly, I'd love, love to come over and speak to you. I gave a talk to um, CBA Midlands um, conference uh, a few years ago before COVID, I think, um, but I'm always very keen to, to go and speak when whoever will have me. <laughs> thanks, thanks Keith. Ben, did you want to come in on that as well? Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I think Keith's, you know, not the nail on the head there. It's about bringing all the people together. But this is one of the difficulties we've had in 
anyone who works in archaeology from from any of the angles, um, you know, whether whether it's a you know a personal interest or academic or, or professional, um, it's about bringing those people together. And it's one of the most difficult things we've we've got, and it's it's still an issue for all of us. And just working in 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 local authorities in in historic environment records, the number of different people that we're trying to reach and have contact with, and actually give information to and receive information from is 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 extremely challenging and it has been for decades and and it will continue to be and and one of the biggest issues we've got is our capacity for actually connecting up and meeting with all those people and all of the different organizations you know CBA CIFA Algeo Fame you know you can go on and on and on each one of those organizations represents thousands and thousands of different people coming from different angles and some of them are members of more than one group and I defy anybody to have a fantastic project where you get all of those people integrated and working together in, in harmony. It's extremely difficult. So what Keith's trying to do is, is, is very, very difficult, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try and that we shouldn't do the best. That's the way we've always done it in archaeology. We do as much as we possibly can in the best way we possibly can and try and get as many people involved as together. We're not going to reach everyone. And we're still going to have those individuals and those groups going off doing their own thing. But if we can have a framework and a structure that does bring as many people together as possible, it's at least a good start and the best we can do. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. Uh, I think one of the things we want to pick up, um, we've got a tea break session to round off the Innovation Festival this afternoon um, at three o'clock. And that will look at sort of some of the barriers to innovation and doing things differently and, and changing our approaches. And I think lack of time resources to actually think about different ways of doing things is, is a can be a significant barrier because a lot of people are so hard pressed. We rely on our kind of tried and tested methodologies or, or, or you know, perhaps less positively sometimes just doing it the way we've always done it because we don't have the time to think about mm. doing it differently and, and I think that is a, a real challenge and 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 certainly in some of the conversations that we've had Perry in, in actually sort of changing mindsets <laughs> and changing approaches <laughs> um that you know that 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 is a a, a particular barrier um did you want to come back on that Perry or or um of, if, if there's anything you want to add otherwise I'll move us on to no to it's fine I'll, I'll come back later later on in the, in the end session thanks very okay. much Brilliant. Cheers. Thanks. Thank you, Perry. Um, any other questions in the room? Um, I've got one on the chat here from Richard Hughes, um, who notes that the, the, the thrust of the presentations and the discussion so far has been mostly focusing on rural sites. And um, he's looking forward to comments on innovative uses in urban um, situations and, and, and excavations. Any of the panel members want to come in on that and the potential to use um, is, is this predominantly of use in, in rural settings or other applications for, for urban excavation? I don't see why it has to be confined to rural. Uh, it, any deposit is game, basically, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah, I think I'd say the, um, is it PDAP case method? Uh, um, obviously. It obviously needs to be flexible and suited to the site that you're working on. But if you look at what Norfolk suggests you should be doing in their area, um, that equally well applies to urban as, as rural sites. I mean, I think most of the people on the panel mostly work in rural sites. Obviously, Wessex do both. But um, yeah, I don't know if we've got any urban specialists on the call who want to say anything. Well, um... Can I just mention that uh, another sort of inspirational moment for me um, was um, when I went to a talk uh, about um, a, a huge shopping complex uh, being built in the, the heart of Oxford. It actually was in the heart of medieval Oxford. And um, so it was an absolutely fascinating talk. And they'd put an on-site museum there, which is getting better footfall than most other museums. It was so um, popular. So at the end of that talk, um, I asked the question, um, had you used any metal detectors on the project? Bearing in mind, this was the largest archaeological project ever in Oxfordshire. 
And the answer was actually, no, we really wish we had it done because we'd have found so much more. Now, of course, we've got two things there is you know, so much more information as far as dating ev evidence uh, uh, and defining the site, but also the fact that you've got an on site museum where the, some of the things that we could have found would have been so fascinating to the local community as well. So um, yeah, my thoughts are is that um, certainly all, all types of projects uh, have got to be of interest um, for using metal detectors or, and, and um, education, educated detectorists. Um, and that would be interesting actually to see where this sits in, in the briefs. You know, what, what, where do the county archeologists see that, that we should be used? Can I ask both Keith and Tom, what's the level of independent use is within urban contexts? Because obviously we're not suggesting, anybody can go out and stroll over a field with any equipment they want. I mean, they're either caught or they're not, or they have permission or whatever, but it's much, much easier out of a town to use a metal detector. In a town, what is the, the sort of background noise, as it were? When, because obviously we're not really suggesting that metal detectorists or even groups of interested amateurs just go and dig holes willy nilly mm -hmm. in any way, shape or form. But if there is that background level of use, I think that's something archeologists don't even really even think about. Tom, what's your thoughts? Um, <clears throat> I mean, the, the, to be quite blunt, the reason why the vast majority of metal detectors, hobby metal detectors, are out in the countryside is because they're on cultivated land. Yeah. Which brings up new things every year, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Um, a lot of um, urban metal detecting, evening back gardens or whatever, is um, in the too difficult box, probably, right. simply okay. because of the background um, trash, for want of a better term, in that there is such a lot of metal in the soil, in the background, in um, urban sites, that it actually makes metal detecting, as a hobby, probably very difficult. Hmm. So there's probably, that is why the majority is out in rural settings. Hmm. That's kind of how I'd assumed it was, mm -hmm. but um, <laughs> it's something that I hadn't really considered in any great depth, I have to admit. I can see that uh, that Sandy Kid has his hand up. Um, Sandy, do you want to come in here? Hi, yeah. Um, as a team leader for the Greater London Archaeological Advisory Service, perhaps I'll I can give both, well, both a rural and an urban perspective, because I used to be, uh, used to be county archaeologist in Buckinghamshire, and I'll just reflect there that we used to have in our standard uh, requirements the use of metal detectors on uh, appropriate uh, investigations, and I do remember um, the, the, a session of the Rural and Rural Settlement Project from, gosh, must have been probably about 15 years ago now, where um, they, they, they were looking at the rate of metal discoveries on rural sites and uh, the, the, let's just say they compared our county with um, uh, another nearby county which had better remain nameless that didn't have that requirement and noted the dramatically different levels of metal recovery from Roman rural settlement sites. So uh, another piece of, of evidence, quantified evidence in that case, that, that, that the techniques you apply do, do make a difference. Um, as far as urban sites are concerned, I mean, it's been really interesting to hear all of this, and I'm, we're in the process of, of reviewing our uh, our general guidelines for work in Greater London and I've, I've already made a note that to check what on earth we're saying about metal detecting because I, I slightly embarrassedly think I'm, I'm not entirely sure how much it, it is used on some of the truly urban sites. So I draw a distinction between what we might describe as greenfield urban sites, things like public parks and, and the like, where um, we certainly do on occasion put 
push for metal detecting. I'm thinking of an example of some field work on the site of the uh, Brentford Bass English Civil War battlefield uh, within the last year um, where we pushed for that. Um, but you know, a way, uh, but but sort of casual metal detecting in those situations is actually not normally permitted because they are public land and public, you know, and being a public accessible land as well. So, so the limitations are very uh, are sort of quite great there. Um, and then the sort of true urban construction sites, you come across the issues which a previous speaker referred to of the controls on health and safety controls on construction sites, the, the requirement for um, accreditation through through on health and safety, these CSCS cards and such like. Um, but I think that's something we, we need to do some more work on as well. Uh, and the other area where metal detecting, of course, occurs is along the river, along the Thames, where there is a lot of the mudlarking type approach which is, is, is the sort of urban equivalent of of rural detecting where you can you can do that under a license from the port of london authority so that there is supposed to be reporting at least for that so it's a it's quite a mixed picture but i definitely sort of one we'll we'll be looking at again over the next few months to make sure we've got our policy right and we may well come back to you and ask keith and ask uh, for for some input into that well, please, please do please do thank you mm. Uh, um, can, can I add, because uh, it's been, been mentioned a couple of times actually about the CSCS card, uh, we've uh, worked with CSCS over a few years on this issue, uh, particularly when they um, made the stipulation that the card will only be given to archaeologists who've got a degree in archaeology. Mm. And um, it was put between CSCS and Build UK that, that metal detecting would uh, sit outside of the requirement for that co that card. So so we're certainly allowed on site now um, uh, under one of those um, uh, categories where we don't need to have a card. But they were very keen on the idea that the uh, institute will be putting together educational courses which will uh, actually bring in things like health and safety and such, and uh, you know a, a much more sort of construction contractual approach to um, utilizing metal detectors on on sites um, so yes we, I think we've made a good start but but by the time we, we've got a little bit further into methodology standards and guidance then you know th that will simplify us be, you know getting onto sites I think good Yes, good to hear. Thank you, Keith. Um, I can see Richard um, has his hand up. Richard, did you want to, you were the original poser of the question. Yeah, okay. Um, following on from Sambia's comment, um, it seems to me that in, and I suppose it applies to a rural uh, situation as well as the urban, that um, some of the layers of information that we collect during excavation um, now encompass things like, um, distribution of phosphates, nitrates, uh, fatty organic molecules, lipids, and so on. So we, we're building up out of the soil uh, layers of information. And it would seem to me that looking at um, iron compounds could be yet another layer. So not just literally pinpointing metal artifacts, but for example, looking at magnetic susceptibility as we do in geomorphological situation. So I was wondering whether things like background noise actually when looked at systematically um, and with using your AI and machine learning and so on could yield a lot more information on, on the metal, uh, hidden metal um, uh, uh, um, kind of parameters of, of soil conditions. Did you want to come in on that, Keith? Yes, um, but well, yeah, very, very interesting. Um, it, it's the, the, the closest I've sort of been to understanding any of that really was uh, when we were working with um, geochemistry and magnetic susceptibility on, on, a, on a project. Um, uh, as do you know, I, I think that that's a, a sort of a question I've, I've really not even expected to come along. I don't know 
enough about that to uh, to be able to comment. Um, you know, we, we know when it comes to sort of detecting slack and search for manufacturing, um, but but in this particular instance, uh, you know, I'd love to um, speak with you more and learn to see what we could do or help to offer on that. And Tom, I don't know if you if you can dig me out of that hole I've got into really with that one. Or you are un You're unmuted. Muted, I think Tom. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, with any met metal, especially the, the the more modern metal detectors, um, there is a great facility to notch out um, the majority of signals if you're particularly looking at one uh, particular frequency, which potentially might be able to be used. But again, I am not um, technically minded enough <laughs> about the machines and the modern machines um, to say yes or no. It would. I think trialing and uh, discussing it more and testing would probably be a very a very useful thing to do. Certainly, I think there's there's something in there, isn't there, about aligning um, research questions with techniques and actually um, the techniques we use, the tools we use, um, are are informed by the research questions that we're asking, <laughs> but also there's potential for those research questions to be adapted and changed depending on the tools and techniques that we have available and as they progress and develop um, and, and new innovations um, make different techniques available to us that that then influences the research questions that we're that we're able to um, ask and the the, the breadth and, and depth of, of, of understanding that we're that we're able to achieve um, again something that we can um, potentially pick up on in other sessions that would look that where we could look to um, to explore some of that, I think is a, 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 a rapid. I wonder if I wonder if these kind of specific question might be best um, put to people like Historic England Science Advisors who have that kind of broad area where they look at uh, things all relating to the science of archaeology. I mean, we we have environmental sampling that takes place on archaeological sites, um, and but that's focused on specific aspects of usually the soil or the or the deposit. But there's no reason why it couldn't pick up things like content of iron or metals you know and and, and other things but, but mm. I don't know enough about that but you do have environmental archaeologists and specialists and maybe I would start with the science advisors um, and check with them. Thanks Ben. Toby. Yeah um, you, you kind of mentioned at the start that you were thinking that safer thinking of maybe doing some sort of standard and guidance for metal detectors is that, is that correct or did I get did I get the wrong end of the stick uh, you also said everybody's far too busy which I quite agree with I think, well, at the moment we're talking um Keith with Keith and, and and the institute as to how so I think we would look in as part of our revision of CIFA standards of guidance to um what we can do to strengthen um, the use of metal detecting as a technique, but I think it would be for the Institute of Detectorists to produce the standards about then the more detailed specification as to as as to how that might happen and the, the sort of framework within that that with that within which sorry I can get my words out um, that would happen and and I think jointly badged standards potentially there would have the most the most weight or at least two sets of standards that articulate and talk to each other. Um, yeah, yes, Toby. Really um, helpful. Yeah, uh, I know, uh, Toby. When you mentioned that that um, we, uh, we we need to have a more sort of a thorough investigation and um, and and testing on to the methodologies around DAPAS, um, what we've been very keen not to do is to do too much ourselves because we want much more of a collaborative approach with everyone to see how best to put this together. And um, you know, the way I think it would work perfectly is if we can then sort of formulate that into methodology, standards and guidance through the Institute, which then can be signposted um, from the CIFA and others, but, but to work particularly closely with CIFA really. So it could be a sort of a joint badged approach on this. Be very, very useful, even if it will involve a lot of herding of cats. But, uh... <laughs> herding of cats is what we do, I think. Um, 
and and actually getting that structure right of 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 um, looking at where we want to uh, what we want to articulate into a standard what is actually about good practice guidance and what's a more detailed specification that might be different on different types of sites in different areas and different contexts depending on what the what what the survey is trying to achieve and what the research questions are um, so there is that that sort of hierarchy of documentation that we can that we can use. Do you have uh, any other? Uh, Sorry, Keith. Yeah, add that when we look at um, how things have developed really over this last um, nearly six years of trying to um, de develop the institute, uh, it, it's been very difficult because of the fact that um, you know you have um, hobbyist detectors which are, are trying to prevent it from going on. So it's it's not going to be one of these things which can be easily funded through um, membership in their tens of thousands, like, um, you know, jo join other um, metal detecting memberships, which, which are actually more now in line with sport than, than heritage. In fact, they're one of the new main groups out there is the Association of Metal Detecting Sports. So it's, um, you know, our line that we've always tried to go down, um, the heritage line, um, does mean we need funding to get to where we need to get um, go to. And um, and I think, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that we're very close to achieving that at the moment, so that, um, you know, if there is 30,000 detectors out there, we may be able to attract two, three or 4,000, which will make this all very viable. Um, I'm sorry, Keith, I'm going to have to ask, is metal detector a sport done wearing light crew and at speed? <laughs> I've never attended one of the... the runs, so. oh, I think you've got to. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, no, I think even when you look at the uh, the NCMD, um, which have got I think twenty three thousand members or so, um, you know that always has been aligned to heritage. And and when you think of the DCMS, it's been more aligned to the sports side of the DCMS rather than what we've been trying to do as members of the Heritage Alliance is to move it um, across to uh, um, to heritage where it really should um, sit. But, but you know, as I mentioned before, um, you know, the, the, this can only really work if everybody from the heritage and archaeology communities gets behind it and to help drive it forward. Because um, you know, the, 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 the strength and power of the numbers on the hobby side, which are trying to stop it from happening, um, that they can jump around Facebook so quickly um, that it makes life very, very difficult. But um, it makes it difficult for the for the detectorists, which are really keen to be involved, who, who daren't put their head above the parapet to say they want to support it. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it... it it was never going to be easy, put it that way. But um, but but with the more support we can get from uh, heritage and archaeology communities, the the better it will be. Keith, could you say any more about the specifics of what you're hoping Historic England will fund for you? Yeah. Yes. And if, if um, what would be because the the feasibility study came out extremely positively so um you know if you look at the historic england um uh, research study um I, I can't remember the name uh, the, the number of it but if you re, if you google um institute of detectress and historic england you'll see the research number for it and we've got three different parts of that feasibility study where we've gone into huge depth about everything on on this um, but what we're really looking to do now is to open up to membership the problem being is, is that if it's not done in an incredibly professional way in a way to um interest people rather than to dictate to people so so the education is got to be done in a way where it's really quite i wouldn't say entertaining but 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 very very interesting this is the funding that we're hoping to get so we can get a platform where a membership can come on board and we can interact with the, uh, the membership we can come up with really good um educational videos which are interesting videos in in bringing up these subjects where we'd love to speak to um so many which are probably on here today who are specialists in their subject and we can talk about 
um, you know, their experiences and knowledge and how metal detecting might, or sorry, I've got to stop saying metal detecting because we're interested in everything, how detecting um, can, can um, benefit us uh, all. So that, that's really where our next stage of funding is, it, it's to allow us to actually put that professional platform together and the, the educational videos to actually open up for membership. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Keith. I'm, I'm mindful of time um, and, and also the potential that, that, that we could carry on um, for a lot longer um, discussing uh, all of these issues. Are there any final questions from anybody, um, any, any of our, our delegates this morning that you'd like to put to Keith or any of the panel members? I can't see any hands up. We've got some links in the chat um, to that feasibility study, if anybody wants to have a look in more detail. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Um, so I think I'll draw us to a close. Uh, it's been really um, interesting and useful discussion this morning. Um, let's say the recording will be available and we'll try and capture any comments and um, observations in the chat. That we haven't been able to to pick up on in the discussion although I think I think we covered most of it but uh, so I'd like to thank um, Keith and Toby and Ben and Rachel and Tom for for joining us this morning thanks ever so much for that and thanks to everybody who's who's joined us and participated and please do come back um, at one o'clock there's just about time for a quick lunch um, for part two of this session, where we will be looking at assessing, mapping and quantifying our ecological potential and uh, the evaluation of, of evaluating evaluations, um, Richard Hyams, PhD, um, looking at trial trench strategies. Um, so, yeah, yeah, please go off and have your lunch and we'll see you back hopefully at one. Joining us for the second um, part of this session, looking at innovation in predictive techniques. Um, I'm just going to, um, at the risk of, of being boring and repetitive, run through the housekeeping um, again, just for those people who weren't with us this morning. So just to let you know that today's session is being recorded and the recordings will be available to all the Innovation Festival delegates as soon as possible after the session. Please do keep your microphones on mute during the presentations. Um, if you're happy to leave your cameras on that's great it's always lovely to see people but we know that sometimes it's not uh, ideal or possible to do that so that's that's entirely up to you um there will be plenty of opportunities for questions and discussion in the session but if you want to raise anything in the chat please do that i'll try and keep an eye on the chat and make sure that any um questions or observations or comments that we don't get to in discussion are, are picked up um if you do want to ask a question live as it were in person then just raise your virtual hand and um we'll ask you to unmute so that you can do that um again i know i don't really need to say this to you but we do want the discussion to be positive for everyone today and so we would ask everyone to show respect courtesy and consideration to the other delegates um and do let us know if you've got any concerns about that in the chat and we will do what we can to resolve them. Um, we don't have a break in this session. Um, we're going straight through. It's it's an hour and a half. Um, but uh, if you do need to, obviously, get up and 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 refresh your your mugs of tea or glasses of water, then then please please do that. So I think on that note, and um, hopefully everybody who is rejoining us is here and, and I'd, I'm sure there will be a few more people um, coming in as, as we kick off. It's a bit of a, a lunch and learn session. Um, I will start us off and we're talking about innovative approaches um, to assessment and evaluation predominantly and we're going to start off with Sandy Kidd of the Greater London Archaeological Advisory Service to talk about assessing, mapping and quantifying archaeological potential. So um, over to you, Sandy. Thank you. Great. Good afternoon. Right. I shall share screen. I hope this is the right one. Hopefully you can see a slide now. Um, 
Right. So um, I'm going to start um, with a bit of a trigger warning. <laughs> um, experience suggests that not everybody will like what I'm going to say. Um, uh, I'd like to reassure people that this is not what I'm, what I'm going to talk about is not a replacement of existing good practice. It's, it's an addition to it. Um, and at the heart of what follows is an observation that quantitative methods play a big part in academic archaeology um, and, uh, and, and a significant role in post-excavation, but are rarely deployed in planning related assessments. And part of this is really to encourage the, the thinking along those lines. Um, some credits where credit is, is due. Um, the, what I'm going to talk about form part of uh, a, a secondment that I did last year with the archaeological investigations team in historic England, uh, looking at archaeological sensitivity mapping. It was prompted by the uh, proposals in the white paper of a couple of years ago to go move towards the zonal planning system. But the way we looked at it is, was not sort of linked to a specific legislative framework. Uh, and I think many of the lessons are of much wider applicability. Um, some of this, uh, what it follows, is, are things that both I and Jonathan Last, uh, my co-worker on the project, um, have already spoken about, including at a CIFA event I think, earlier this year. Um, but the, the, there are the new elements, particularly towards the, the end of this talk. Um, what I want to, to do is really start with a, three parts to this. Firstly, a, a conceptual overview, um, which is, I, I think, you know, is something of a personal view and where, where we are and where how we've got here and, and the changes that, that this approach uh, potentially brings, brings forward. Um, how that engages and how that engages with actual practice. Um, secondly, I want to look at how we built a case study uh, in the Vale of Aylesbury in Buckinghamshire. And thirdly, and this is the newest bit, I want to show how that case study was calibrated using the results from the from High Speed 2 route, which runs through the study area. And indeed, the study area was chosen precisely because, or for one of the reasons for choosing it, was because it was traversed by the HS2 route. So it could be used as, as a test. Um, so yes, here are the, the credits for those who particularly who've supported, but there are many, many people who've provided advice and support through the last, last couple of years, and it's not possible to name everybody. Right, um, so let's start from the beginning. Um, like some of the colleagues out of the older colleagues in this meeting, I started my archaeological career around the time that PPG 16 came in. Uh, and it seems to me, it seemed to, seems to me in looking back on it, that at that time and certainly before that, we were in a stage of what you might describe as an age of discovery. We simply, for much large parts of the country, had such a poor uh, understanding of what was out there, um, particularly in terms of the pre-medieval landscape, that we just didn't know what we were going to find on projects, particularly large-scale greenfield projects. Um, and we were a bit like we were in the situation of here we are Cook and Banks exploring the South Pacific in the 18th century and do it making the only sort of you know the first really substantial western contact with these these environments western scientific investigation of these areas and the only sensible approach there is to simply map and collect uh, samples of, of those areas from those, those areas so that we can start to begin to understand what was out there and i think many of our early projects uh, development related projects were just of that nature really just looking to see what we could find. And that was perfectly well and good in, at that stage in the development of our profession. Um, but I'd like to suggest that at least in some parts of the country, those which have seen more intensive development in the last 30 years or survey work, that we have, we have or can and should move on from that type of approach and start to transition towards a more analytical 
basis. And, and we shouldn't be frightened of this. If we think about the development of other scientific disciplines, we shouldn't be worried about that. We should embrace it and, and work with it. Um, so that's a little bit of the sort of some of the nervousness I've encountered, I think, comes from experiences that have been had in the past with some of these types of techniques where perhaps the evidence base wasn't wasn't strong enough or the way we were using them wasn't wasn't appropriate. So we just need to think about uh, how we develop them. So here are some uh, propositions that we developed for, for the sensitive demapping project. Uh, the, perhaps the most important one at the beginning is that you know, we think that from the last you know, the last 30 years of work, the idea that there are vast blank areas in the English landscape without any archaeological interest has been pretty well and truly falsified. So rather than coming at this from the assumption that that we're looking for nuggets of archaeology within within uh, blank areas, we have to start from the proposition that essentially most of the English landscape has some archaeological interest, at the very least in finding out what's actually there. Uh, even if it's not very much, the, the, even blank, even uh, relatively empty areas still have an interest. Um, the, in order to move forward, we do need to know enough about the recorded resource in order to be able to make reasonable, tolerably reasonable inferences or extrapolations from what is known to what might be discovered in the future. And that, and lastly, that brings us on to the point that we can perhaps think, draw a, a rough analogy between uh, archaeological ways of thinking and uh, what, what our, our, hard, our hard scientists, physicists think about uh, the way they think about the, the natural world and, and the distinction between uh, particles and waves. I'm sure you all know, you know, photons can be thought of as both particle-like and wave-like and display those different characteristics in different circumstances. So, you know, and, and, uh, this, this uh, analogy, you might think of our assets are sort of things which have sufficient significance uh, uh, and sufficiently well defined to be treated as assets in the planning system as being the equivalent of particles, localized entities with, with discrete boundaries. Um, but, but also archaeological potential has this wave-like characteristic that it's, it's, it's everywhere in different levels of intensity. And, and some of what we show you in sort of the diagrams that follow and maps that follow, sort of you might want to think about it in, in that sort of way. Um, uh, just that sort of approach might you might look at, at the work, recent academic work in that sort of way here. Uh, on the left, you see the distribution of excavated farmsteads from Roman rural settlements project, a sort of point based system, and then the more a general sort of density distributions that have come out of the Englade project. So uh, again, you know, a slightly different way of looking at very similar, similar data sets. And um, when we started to think about sensitivity, Jonathan and I and, and colleagues, we, we had to think, well, well, what do we actually mean? Uh, what actually makes, uh, makes something sensitive? And obviously we need something to be there the presence of some, of some entity of archaeological interest. Um, we, we thought that condition would be a really important aspect of, of that, you know, the, are, are assets well preserved, and this you can make this or, or not, and you can make those judgments whether or not you know there's an asset there given land use history of an area. Significance is obviously uh, a key element of, of what matters. Uh, and then something we didn't really get into in great detail because of, of, of lack of time uh, was the, but was then the uh, then what are the particular threats or, or opportunities that arise from, from that sensitivity? But we, you know we recognise that's there. And beneath that, you can you can see the, the, the list of some of the ranges of data sets we were using. We were trying to use a wide range of GIS-based data sets um, rooted in historic environment records, but not limited by any means to them. Um, one of the challenges of what we were trying to do uh, is that, of course, we weren't trying to model a particular period. Most academic projects, one imagines, would look at uh, a particular issue, uh, whether that's Roman rural settlement or whatever. Um, whereas 
we were trying to model the totality of, of the landscape and that created certain challenges um, because uh, you know, if you think about, uh, as you'll see in a moment, uh, we think about trying to, to identify which aspects of the known, as, of known aspects of the landscape correlate with, with, with archaeological discoveries and therefore infer other areas which might also correlate with things yet to be discovered. Um, it's probably fairly reasonable to think that the distribution of a particular period, say the Mesolithic, uh, might be conditioned by the by the uh, the technology and the cultural assumptions of people in that time and might show certain regularities but it's far from clear that that uh, the the bronze age or the or the uh, or, or norman a uh, Nor Norman uh, medieval period would show the same or in the, the same uh, logic. So you would obviously you get this um, palimpsest effect of, of of different sort of priorities uh, coming through in different periods and, and different methodologies being need to be used to of course to detect those those sites. So that was something we had to to face in the study uh, and and make and is a certain muddying effect I suppose on what you can see. So I said at the beginning that the intention of this approach is not to replace existing good practice, existing survey methods. And this is an attempt to think about the different techniques we use in relation to the scale of, uh, of the decision making that's involved. And we very much see this process as being one that is needs to look at scale of um, hundreds of square kilometers, not small areas I mean it will give you predictions about small areas but you can't make those predictions without looking at the scale of hundreds of, uh, of, of square kilometers of minimum absolute minimum of 100 um, uh, and there are very and one might reflect that there are very few current survey methods that we use at the moment which can operate at that scale aerial survey is the only one I can immediately think of, somebody may stand to, cor to correct me on that. Um, and of course, the you know, aerial survey is very much determined by or affected by things like geology and, and land use. Um, so, you know, it has its own limitations, although extremely valuable. So, the, so in a way, it's fi filling a gap in the way we think about or the way we analyze our data. So this is the area I looked at. Um, so three, almost 300 square kilometers. Uh, it spans the, uh, Ch the Chilterns uh, Chalk Hills area of outstanding natural beauty in the south of the area. Um, and then to the north, and that's an ancient, typically characterized as an ancient landscape. Uh, and then to the north, the champion landscape of the Vale of Aylesbury, part of essentially part of the South Midlands. Um, and it's an area that's seen quite a lot of development in the last 30 years, so growth area, it's got high speed two running through it, as you'll see uh, later. Um, it has a well-developed historic environment record with an alert mapping system and historic landscape characterization, but it doesn't have aerial survey in any sort of systematic sort of way. Um, so uh, it also happened to be well known to, to me, uh, which was was helpful in getting started. So that's sort of some of the reasons why, why, why we, we chose, chose it. It's a fairly typical area, perhaps, of inland, um, in, inland uh, south and east of England. Uh, well, I'm not surprisingly, we started simply by pulling together evidence of known assets um, which either are of archaeological interest or potentially might be. Uh, and there's a range, just gives you an idea of, of the range uh, of, of assets that are present. And interestingly, 12.5% um, of the study area is already identified from the historic environment record as having archaeological potential either because of um, of there's a known monument or there are finds from the area such like so there's direct evidence on historic environment record but there is something in that location 
Um, yeah, I won't go too much into that. Just to say, in order to structure the data, it was necessary to use uh, a simple period and type of asset-based system. And this was adapted from the Englade uh, model for classif simple classification, just so that we could, uh, we could make a systematic analysis. And you'll see in the end there, once you know, you work out what's in the area, uh, then you can give and immediately start moving into things like asset densities for different periods. So you can start to put some numbers together from that basic uh, assessment. Uh, and that one you know, shows a, a distribution by period. So uh, you can see that you know, this, this particular study area is dominated by later medieval and uh, Roman assets um, with sort of quite a smattering of, of Bronze Age and, and Iron Age uh, and not much earlier and a bit thin in post-medieval, but of course, post-medieval assets are, uh, are dealt with it in other ways, which probably explains that. And you can also see that the scheduled monuments follow a similar, but slightly, but interestingly different, also slightly different pattern. So you can just start to get some sense of what is known in by period. And then we might think about, well, is that reflected in what's being found in actual investigations, which might suggest that the HR is a reasonable representation or not of what's known. So then moving on from that, we looked at how these assets were distributed in relation to different factors which we thought might influence their distribution either positively or negatively. Um, uh, and in fact, in fact, it turned out that geology was not a particularly strong indicator, although it did come out in some respects. Uh, uh, so for example, the limestone geology seemed to be a bit more favored. Um, the, uh, and, and some other geologies uh, less so, but not, not, to a, not to a strong degree. But what we were looking for were, were um, ex outliers where the distribution was unlikely to be a matter of pure chance. Um, so we use you know, some very simple statistics to try and work that out. I'm sure that could be looked at much more deeply and thoroughly than, than I was able to do, but it's at least uh, shows the principle. Um, and here, uh, so we looked at geological and topographical indicators in the previous slide. Here, we're looking at more cultural indicators. So we find stronger connections between archaeology and conservation areas, um, archaeology and listed buildings and churches, um, uh, and not and actually shown on there, but, but also proximity to scheduled monuments. So that's not a surprise, but it's interesting to see uh, you know, using the statistics to understand how much of an influence and how far from the asset does that influence extend. So again, we put the hunches, testing the hunches, which hunches actually bear out uh, a connection and which don't. Um, so Roman roads, for example, didn't do very well, um, but, but other things do. So you start to sort of focus in on those indicators which are evidence-based and you start to put some numbers on the degree of influence they have. So there's an example, uh, medieval churches show a very, a very strong co correlation in this area. Um, and that correlation runs out to about 400 meters. But beyond that, you go back to uh, the background level of probability. Um, and just a few examples of, um, and, uh, of these buffers around scheduled monuments and churches and showing how they relate to archaeology that's been found in investigations. So, you know, there are some, again, you may feel not that surprising, but nevertheless, it's nice to see it in the numbers and interesting that other things you might think were more success would be successful when were not so successful. Um, how did we deal with historic periods? Well, we had, as I said earlier, we, we had the benefit of a, a, a good HLC study, which had captured sort of useful data on, on, on historical land use patterns, which allowed us to come up with some broad brush mapping of the sort of pre-modern, I suppose you might sort of late medieval uh, landscapes, defining areas of open fields, old enclosures, ancient woodlands, commons, meadows, downlands, etc. So we thought, you know, that HLC, and, and I know that there are very 
mixed views on HLC and very mixed qualities of HLC studies, but a good HLC can help you very much, I think, in understanding uh, the, the historic landscape to the point where you can start to make predictive uh, suggestions about what's likely to be found in particular locations. And that just led to this sort of mapping of these buffers and other factors. I won't go too much into that. The other thing we uh, looked at was uh, how you model condition and historic environment records are not typically terribly good at, or systematic in the way they record the condition of assets, nor in descriptions uh, that we make in, in archaeological assessments. So we often uh, either systematic or, 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 or necessarily consistent. So uh, we came up with this um, uh, framework for which you, which was an attempt to really just take a broad brush view and say, well, are we expecting uh, you know, exceptional preservation? Are we expecting broadly average preservation or poor preservation, depending upon recent land use history and uh, the uh, geology uh, 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 and chemical condition of the area. So are we dealing with a wetland environment or, or, or one with a highly acidic soils, for example, or are we looking at, um, are we looking at areas of, of, of intensive agriculture or, 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 uh, you know, or modern development? Um, so it's fairly, it's fairly crude and basic, but you know, it is nevertheless an important important factor in considering the significance of, of what you might find. And there was a, a, a and, and just to emphasize that you know, we using HLC as a basis, but also other types of GIS data sets, um, typically land cover, um, uh, geology, uh, and a number of other data sets, which might vary from place to place, depending on what, what's available. So you, class, you end up with a classification, a, a bit like characterization, covering the whole your whole of your study area or, or of the what we we see as the preservation potential um, and that's what it it looked like quite a patchy one uh, for the Vale of Aylesbury I should say that that we also did one in the uh, lower Thames Valley in Essex um, which was much because it had a coastal zone and then and then a, a, a gravel um, gravel terrace was much uh, much more clearly zoned than this, um, uh, yeah, whereas this one is, is much more of patchwork, but that probably that simply reflects the nature of, of, of the land, land use and the landscape in, in this area compared to uh, an area with more distinct topographic uh, de, uh, variation. In order to sort of try and sense check all of this, we, we looked at a series of um, uh, of case studies, mostly greenfield developments, but also three uh, his historic causes which had seen significant investigation. And that was sort of almost 4% of the study area. And that again allowed us to look at the influence of certain characteristics. So the baseline average is one, uh, on, and you can see that certain um, characteristics, certain indicators are good indicators of where you actually find archaeology when you get in to do evaluation and mitigation, uh, and others are either negative or, or, or seem to be neutral. So you can start to pick out those factors again and test them against the other data. You can also look at the extent of, of which uh, of archaeology which is found on all of these sites, and you can start to see some patterns arriving there with um, large development areas typically having between 5 and 20 percent uh, archaeological coverage in this area. So coming on to the final bit, um, the HS2 test was aimed for, based on the data which we got from the HER in Bucks, which was we deliberately chosen data which was around the period of 2012 before the HS2 evaluations work started. So we were making the, the idea was to make the predictions based on the data from 2012, go back in 2022 and say, how well did those predictions work? Um, so here we are, that's the study area. Um, and then the, the predictions may, uh, came up with a series of low average and high estimates, depending upon the, the, what assumptions you made about the visibility of assets within the HER uh, and uh, looking also at the case studies. So we were looking overall, how many assets would you expect to find of that type? 
and where might they be found, found and we also looked at preservation and there was a, a simple uh, formula there that, that was used to, to make that calculation. So, um, and that's just to give a, an idea of the, the actual evaluation uh, work wasn't carried out over the whole of the consented area of uh, 700 odd hectares, about two thirds of it was subject to um, a field evaluation of one kind or another. Um, and we made these four predictions, the percentage of, of overall coverage of archeology, span the condition of, of assets, the periods that would be represented and where things would be found. Um, and here we are looking at the, the whole of the HS2 study area. You can see about a third was only covered by desk-based assessment, another 20% just by geophysics, 40% um, was trench but without positive results, and 77% found um, something which might be described as uh, an asset of, to which um, different levels of significance could be ascribed by professional judgment. Um, uh, well, right, what's the overall coverage? Yes, so this is all the HS2 uh, sort of sub areas. And uh, I hopefully you can see here that the overall, we were predicting 13.6% of the study area would have archeology span in it. Now, um, because only two thirds was evaluated, um, if you look at the whole of the HS2 study area, the actual answer was 7.4%, but I don't think that's fair because there's a third of it which was never looked at for various reasons. So the, I think the, the, the more accurate assessment is to say they actually found archeology span over about 11.3%. So a little bit under the prediction, but only just. Um, I personally, I thought that was, was close enough for me. Um, but also when you look at the individual, sites you'll find that the smaller subsites are tend to be rather hit or miss you know they can have quite a high proportion of archaeology on them um, uh, or none at all whereas once you get up into the larger sites over 30 hectares they're all pretty much sitting in that five to twenty percent that uh, i mentioned earlier on um, so you know not not bad i thought and then if you put that together with the previous case study data you can begin to see the patterning um, there with this lower sort of lower project size, quite a variety, then tending towards an average, which I think common sense would, would suggest, you know, is quite likely to be the case. Second prediction, um, the condition of assets. There we found that uh, of the 34 assets, um, we had 13 which were accurate, 12 overestimated the, the, the uh, survival and there were nine underestimates, but very noticeably the model performed best at its upper and lower limits where it did quite well and not very well in the middle. Um, so I think there's a lot more to be that could be taken out of this. I don't, although it's not a, an amazing result, um, it is one that I think you could look at more because particularly, if, you know, with desk-based assessment of a route like that, you could look at into more, at more depth on in the land use history of, of individual parcels and tighten up on some things that I think probably just uh, would probably misclassifications if you had a bit more site-specific data. So prediction three, um, we, we came up for, this. Is, these were the periods represented and each, for each period, as I said, we came up with low, medium and high predictions for each period in terms of the number of assets. And it's fair to say that, you know, those, that range was quite broad, um, but really the test provided a, a way of calibrating the model. In other words, it makes a huge difference to the model if you think that, that we know 10% of the assets of a particular period or 25% or for that matter, 75%. Um, so you can see that would make vast difference to your prediction. So having some way of calibrating the visibility of the resource for particular periods is really helpful. Um, and what we found was that the outcomes were consistently at and sometimes above the high prediction. That probably won't come as a huge surprise to, to, to most people listening. It didn't come as a particularly as a surprise to me. Um, 
And what that implies from the numbers, working back from the numbers, is that I've said here that at least for pre-Norman archaeology in Buckinghamshire, they've got they've in this area of Buckinghamshire, they they know about are roughly about 10%, perhaps slightly below 10% of the actual assets that are out there, which is an interesting thing to know, observation, I, I thought. Um, and it does seem to come out fairly consistently. Um, and then if you look at the, at the graph, that shows uh, the prediction um, in blue column, the actual sites. So the sites, investigated sites, which had that period appearing on it. And then the actual assets, obviously there can be more than one asset of a particular period on, on a site. Um, and there, I think, you know, you can see that the overall pattern is remarkably good. I think it's remarkably good. There are a few areas where there are slight variations, um, but uh, overall, I was extremely pleased with that, that, that predict prediction. Um, prediction four, uh, last one, location of archaeological assets. Um, so we, we managed to split the route into these into four categories. The archaeological notification areas, sort of the ones where the HER already suggested there was likely to be something, not definitely, but likely. Um, favoured areas, which were other areas that came out of the modelling and the identification of indicators. Areas which likewise went the other way, which were likely to be less favoured, and then the, 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 the bulk in the middle. And uh, hopefully you can see here that the favoured and notification areas have um, have half the archaeology within them and they are only what less than a, there are less than a quarter of the root area so again that's a, a good indication that they are successfully indicating those areas of higher risk um, uh, and and at the other end the simply the, the, the less favored areas are, are are sort of half half that so uh, and, and I would emphasize that point at the bottom, no blank areas, uh, not at this stage anyway. Um, and this is looking at it in, from a significance point of view uh, by uh, area. And you can see, yes, the notification areas and the favored locations again are doing well at finding significant assets. Um, the less favored areas just have uh, lower significance assets. But interestingly, the neutral, the middle group, which is you know, two thirds, almost two thirds of the, the route, has a fairly even distribution and it does conclude some very important assets. So we can't predict everything. It's just a, a tool for helping us, just like geophysics or aerial photography or any other area survey technique will not find everything. This one won't either. Um, and that shows uh, just the, the things that had the predictive powers again. So just I'll just finish off with a few case studies of the last couple of minutes. Um, here, Roman uh, roadside settlement alongside Aikman Street. Um, the hatched areas there on the plan show uh, the areas of actual archaeology in relation to the red, which was a notification area. Um, and it, it shows very good correlation there uh, between uh, you know, high, good correlation with that, but also not a particularly strong correlation with the Roman roads. So um, that sort of worked fairly well. Stoke Mandeville, um, you all have heard of what was found underneath the church um, and the 400 metre buffer around the medieval church captures a large part of this concentration of archaeology, uh, of multi-period archaeology around the church. Um, so it's not just medieval by any means at all. Uh, and here, up on the edge of the Chilterns, on the chalk, um, the model did successfully predict that the Neolithic would be found on the chalk and not anywhere else near the Icknield Way, which indeed it was. Um, it, the, the, one of the big discoveries of a Neolithic timber circle did appear just outside the area of potential. It was sort of, it was sort of a bit of a near miss, really. Um, uh, and they're also important Roman and Saxon finds in this area. So, so it did, the model did fairly well and could probably be improved in this area. I think what it did highlight, along with another case in one of the other case studies, is that 
at a macro level, there are large topographic, the larger scale topographical areas like this area of the Wendover Gap here, uh, uh, which are not captured by this type of approach. So there might be an, uh, some need to look at a different scale in order to pick out, out these type of topographically favored areas. And there's some pictures of some real archeology span from that area. Um, right, and that's, that, that's it really, just to emphasize how vital HER data is and the need to polygonize things like events data and systematic condition recording, to use a wider range of digital sources, um, to test with case studies, to be realistic about what the model can achieve. It can only be roughly right most of the time at best. Um, and to be very careful about how it's presented and used. Low sensitivity, we don't actually use that term, is not no sensitivity. Um, okay, thank you very much. And it is not an excuse to avoid field evaluation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sandy. Um, there's a huge amount of data in there, but in, in, in delivered in a very short space of time. Is, is there somewhere that, that, that people can go to find out more other than just ringing you up um, <laughs> easily? It, it, um, Jonathan, Jonathan uh, uh, is is Jonathan Last is working on a joint paper which is being sort of uh, reviewed with internal and then external stakeholders and then I will I believe be sort of published as a research uh, paper um, so that yes there, there will be but there isn't isn't yet mm -hmm. great and we can we can um, certainly uh, um, signpost that once once it's available um, I can see hands going up already. So um, I'm going to go to Richard. You there, know, Richard Hughes. Hey, just unmuting. Okay. Hello, Sandy. Thank you very much. That was an excellent um, and a really good presentation about innovative um, undertakings that you're obviously uh, in the middle of doing. I was just thinking about um, following on from your prediction modeling. And going back to that sensitivity matrix that you showed towards the beginning, I was wondering whether the scope for adding a fifth box um, somewhere near condition that looks at risk. So the risk is a product of hazard times vulnerability times condition times resilience divided by robustness. And as a result, you can mathematically model risk. Um, and that risk could be presented as deterministic or probabilistic methodologies um, and then used for natural, looking at natural hazards that affect um, or, or man-made hazards um, and therefore use it as a tool for predicting um, policy towards preservation. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, yes, I, and risk is sort of implied by the fourth box on the bottom right, which talks about opportunity and I kind of harm or threat, um, which is is vital to, to turning the model from a potential model into one which is actually about sensitivity, because the risk, uh, as I'm sure you, you, you know, will, will depend upon what you are potentially going to do to something. Um, so yes, it's in the thinking. We didn't get a chance within our work to go that extra step, but I think you're, you're, you're absolutely right that that is something that needs to, to come forward in order to, to make it a really useful tool because we could be looking at anything from major infrastructure to tree planting to all sorts of, you know, and all sorts of other things. So. And I would see it as adding a layer rather than doing it as a kind of um, here is the risk uh, calculation for a particular site, um, using all your layers and integrating them. So you actually have kind of uh, contours of risk or distribution patterns of risk that would be kind of quite powerful uh, for, for um, looking at, at well, as I mentioned earlier, a, a kind of um, policy towards preservation and protection mechanisms, um, uh, uh, as well as um, prescribing mitigations and, and so on. Yeah, well, I think it'd be useful to, to take this conversation sort of, um, sort of 
forward in, in another another time with, with with colleagues because I think that you know that is very much you know the way we we're, we're looking to see how we can apply this this sort of methodology and what sort of what as I said use cases there are for this um, but but yeah I think you you're you're right that the how that we include risk and the flip side of risk of opportunity into this into these frameworks is still is something we haven't quite got to we know we need to do it but we haven't got to it yet and uh, and i would look at the same as we do for example in arabs related to seismic hazard risk for uh, two-dimensional modeling of large areas of, of, okay. of the world yeah, well, we we could have that. I say we there, could there are conversation. there are pre-existing things that would be useful to 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 kind of take note of. Yeah, but it's okay. Thank Happy you. There are some questions in the chat. I think. Yes, yes, we got a question from Keith May saying, "Could you say any more about whether any measure of the depth or scale of archaeological stratigraphy for the known sites was factored in?" Um, the, not not. Not really, because of the difficulty of getting the data in any systematic way. I was able to factor in where we had known sites that would say survived as as earthworks. Uh, you could factor that in, but anything beyond that is just not readily available in sort of mappable form. I mean, yes, it, data will be hidden away in site reports, but often, of course, the sites that are, you have the detailed data on are the ones that don't exist anymore. Whereas you want the that you want the data on the sites that do exist, and you 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 don't you don't have it. Um, so uh, yeah, at the moment it was very broad brush that sort of thing because the data just isn't readily accessible. Thank you, Keith. I don't know whether you wanted to come back on that at all. Are we happy with that? It's a um, question I, from Lucy. I don't, know, I don't know if you can hear me. Thank, thanks, Andy. I, 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 will, I will follow it up in other ways. Thanks a lot. It was a very interesting presentation. Cheers. Yeah, so we got a couple of questions from, from Lucy Parker. One was about how the 25% of known archaeological archaeology in the area compares to England as a whole. Well, that it's uh, difficult to it's difficult for me to make that direct comparison. Um, the, I would say that the, of the, the two case studies I did, this one and one in essentially in Thurrock in, in, on the edge of Essex, um, interestingly, the density of assets in the Essex study was almost exactly twice that of the density in the Vale of Aylesbury. Now you can you can read that two ways. Maybe there's twice as much archaeology along the Thames, or maybe it's twice as visible. Um, I think the fact that the national mapping program had worked has been done in Essex is a major factor, actually, and that uh, the, the visibility, the higher, that it's probably mostly, but not entirely, explained by higher level of visibility. Um, but I think the the only way, the only other way I can think of looking at this, you know, without doing a lot of work, would be to look at uh, studies like the Englade project, which have taken data from all the HERs and produced the examples of those density maps, which just showed one of them, uh, and that would suggest that that the Vale of Aylesbury is towards the looked at nationally towards the upper middle range. Um, looked at in relation to the south and east of England, it's probably about average. Um, you know, but we have, as they they discovered this very, or, or emphasised this very strong distinction between the north and west being relatively lower densities in most circumstances compared to the south and east. So, yeah, but very difficult. Off the top of my head, I don't know the precise answer to that question. Thanks. And then do you want to pick up on Lucy's second question, which is, I think, what you alluded to at the beginning, about the, the risks of, of this not being understood and being taken on by planners in lieu of investigation by a professional archaeologist? Um, well, well, yes. And, and that is one of, one of the major factors behind the Marmite response this, this gets, because some people have had uh, experience of, of you know this type of thinking being used mi misused I, I i would say that if you avoid things terms like uh, low 
potential and such like, which are unhelpful and wrong, um, then you shouldn't have a problem. In fact, if your, um, if your evidence base demonstrates that you would expect um, five to 20% archeology span on all large sites in your area, then you've got a very good reason for justifying evaluation of any large site, because there's likely to be something there. Thank you. Um, just keeping one eye on time. Any, any? Um, oh, we've got a thumbs up from Lucy. Um, thanks for that. Um, Perry, did you want to, to ask a question? It's, it's a comment, actually, and I think Richard might have heard me say this before. Um, I do think this kind of work's really important, but I just work in uplands where there's not a lot of planning going on, and there are archaeologists working up there, not all the members of SIFA, who are guided in their work with community groups and their own work on projects with a set of assumptions about what they might find and where to look for it and also how to interpret it. It's a kind of scale you need to work at to interpret a site or a fine spot. And I think this kind of work would help a great deal, but the variables you're dealing with in a lowland setting, the serious adaptation in upland areas and uplands occupy 40% of the UK landmass. It goes back to what Sir Lucy is saying. Uh, the methodology is encouraging but the kind of variables you need to work with and the kind of ways in which you need to change archaeologists' mind about how they approach finding that information, um, moving on from traditional methods of uh, environmental sampling or broad brush work to more finely grained investigative methods um, is really important because the, my own research of the last five years suggests there's a huge amount of data loss going on. And I'll finish with one more point. I've had conversations with AOMBs and national parks where they've talked about areas of environmentally high value. And I just said, look, it's very likely those are archaeologically high value as well. Why can't we work together? And well, of course, they don't think that way. And I think your work is really important in starting to get people thinking that way. But it does need adapting really extensively for uplands. Yeah, I, I, we we. Uh acknowledge that I, I mean Jonathan last unfortunately couldn't be here today but he he did two case northern case studies um, and we are in the very early as I say we collectively historic England in the very early stages of thinking about where we go from here and the possibility of, of looking at an upland study but absolutely I mean the the, the, the I mean, one thing I would say is that the the, the methodology uh, can be seen at different levels. It can be seen as a high level conceptual approach. Uh, and then the detail of how you actually do it, I think that is much more flexible, much more open to local variations because there'll be different sort of indicators and exploration of, of what works better, you know, because I mean, this was really very much intended at the beginning as a proof of concept thing. Then we need to talk. I'm writing about mapping our PhD right at the minute. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to talk to you. Great. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks Thank very much. Harry. Um, I'm I'm gonna just draw us to a, a, a close on that now and move on to our next speaker, um, if I may. But please, please do carry on adding um any comments or observations to the chat. So I am going to introduce Richard Heim, um, who is a PhD researcher at University of Brighton um, and who is doing some evaluation of evaluation um, and trial trenching methodologies. Richard, um, over to you, thank you. Um, hi there, thanks very much. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, I'm, my name's Richard Hyam. I'm a final year PhD student at the University of Brighton, uh, working with the PRC Centre for Doctoral Training, SEHA, uh, which is um, primarily heritage science, but also looks at new ways of um, uh, evaluating <laughs> trenching, apparently, as well as um, working with Historic England and Trenton Peak Archaeology. Um, and perhaps, I feel after listening to Sandy's 
uh, presentation, mine should also come with a Marmite warning in the sense that this project, when it began, was primarily looking at the effectiveness of evaluation trenching and perhaps how we can get an idea about that. And uh, a lot of, it's one of these things which actually seems to not, perhaps not cover all the questions that people want answered. And certainly with trenching, there seems to be um, a, a, a lot, as the EVALS 1 project has recently um, found out. So what I'd uh, like to do today is I'm going to talk to you, first of all, about a brief um, bit of my PhD where I talk to a lot of the curatorial archaeologists around the country in quite an informal survey to just find the normal recommendation practice and uh, seeing what, what, um, you know, what, what people's norms were and their rules of thumb, even though, of course, there are no rules of thumb. And actually, um, it was, uh, the results were very interesting. I think it, that's an area for a much more detailed approach. That was originally just developed to look at, is there a kind of way that um, things are normally done across the country is, is there um, or do, is there large differences from county to county of people facing the same challenges and then I'm going to talk a bit more about one of my main methods which is um, modeling results uh, modeling trenching sorry layouts across hypothetical sites and real site data and just looking at these very simplistic results and having to think about what that might mean for our archaeological conclusions and then finally talk about um, another part of my work, which is um, beginning now. This presentation is actually slightly similar to the one I gave at CIFA in, at the, you know, in spring, but it's moved on slightly. So if anybody was watching that one, hopefully people see changes. Um, and also at the end, uh, listening to all the talks today, there's been a lot of very interesting questions. So hopefully we can all kind of uh, continue to talk about um, uh, innovation and uh, the subjects we've been talking about today. I'm afraid this, by focusing on trenching, some people might not find it very innovative because we've been doing trenching for some time and it's actually looking at um, you know, the normal ways of doing trenching, but yeah, hopefully it's interesting. So do we have a way to normally evaluate? And uh, and when I say evaluate, I don't mean the desk-based assessment stage or the almost previous stage where we decide archaeological potential. I'm talking about when there has been the deci this decision made, often based off the HER, um, to then evaluate what, what happens. And uh, you know, this map here shows the different areas uh, where I got responses from curatorial archaeologists, mainly uh, this focuses on rural evaluation, but uh, I will talk a bit about urban evaluation as well. And um, one thing I'd really like to say is that this is a, was quite an informal survey and it wasn't, it was very targeted to talk about trenching. So um, there, you know, there is a multitude of complexity about uh, you know, evaluation techniques and how that's applied, but this was almost a targeted targeted questioning. Um, and another thing I'd like to say is there was differing levels of response. Some people just sent me a link to the county council website. Some people uh, sent me a lot of written information to, and some, uh, some of the, this information was got through meetings. Um, but one thing which came uh, clearly across is that actually across uh, England, we don't have, you know, nothing is hard and fast this is how you must evaluate. And all, all um, respondents made it very clear uh, that each site is reviewed on a site-by-site -site basis. However, having said that, the most commonly reviewed uh, recommended technique is trenching across the country. And the standard in England is to trench at two to 5%. So that actually hasn't really changed a vast amount since the beginning of PPG, where people were trenching at around 2%. You know, perhaps a little bit less or a little bit more. And then after 2001 with Hay and Lacey, people moved to a bit higher trenching coverage. And um, although some people might say that trenching coverage is not a, uh, 
you know, has, has been now is not the most relevant factor. And there are, of course, a number of different factors to do with trenching. But one of the reasons I highlight this is actually it's often how trenching seems to be recommended. And, you know, people make sure that uh, it, it's, um, it, it's in the evaluation, yeah, as part of the evaluation, this coverage of site um, it is, is stipulated. And it's something which is done differently in different countries. For example, in France, the minimum is around 10%. And um, the Netherlands, I think, are similar. Um, and so to have the fact that coverage is, um, site coverage of the sample is asked for in different ways is quite key because it means we might be getting different results. So understanding that is very important. And this figure uh, uh, shows uh, um, some of the percentages mentioned by the uh, curatorial archaeologists in the UK. Um, the uh, blank areas are, uh, people who didn't respond uh, or I wasn't able to get information from. And the gray areas are where people made it very clear that there wasn't really a rule of thumb when it came to um, trenching. But as you can see, what we're seeing is, is um, and also quite perhaps quite unfairly, uh, this is color coded to the minimum amount of trenching, just to highlight you know, th that, that. Another part of the I suppose normal or, or, or rules of thumb that people talked about was, and one of these quite different different ways that uh, people were recommending uh, evaluations was the use of geophysical survey. And some uh, recommendations, again, things were site by site and rarely was there a hard and fast rule, but it was often how, um, people in different areas had found, how effective had people found geophysical survey talking mainly here about magnetometry and, um, uh, and how reliable did curatorial archaeologists find it to recommend um, th these, uh, th this technique based on uh, the, often the geologies and previous results in, the, uh, in their areas. And you know, some areas found geophysical survey more reliable than others. Uh, another key thing to say would be in urban evaluations, of course, this is um, very rarely used uh, because of the feedback, it doesn't work. So um, in urban evaluations, it was primarily trenching and often at a slightly higher percentage or uh, coverage, but rarely, and also a slightly more flexible um, approach, but I'll talk about that later. Another interesting thing, um, and again, just to make it clear, I am very much focusing on trenching. There are a number of other techniques used, um, and, and I'll slightly talk about that, but is how uh, geophysical survey might affect uh, the trenching recommendation and how acceptable do uh, different uh, curators uh, um, find how acceptable is a good geophysical survey in relation to um, uh, the, you know, your, your trenching that you're recommending? Could a good geophysical survey or one which seems to have found a lot actually mean that you don't perhaps have to trench so much or, or it provides you with enough information to make or more information to make the next decision for the, um, for the archaeological work? Um, and a caveat to this is, as I said, this was a very informal survey, and this was something I noticed afterwards when going through everybody's responses that some people volunteered this information of um, there was a potential reduction in uh, trenching or potential change to trenching based on geophysical survey results. But actually, this wasn't a question I asked. So this is you know, perhaps quite a biased figure I'm showing you, but um, uh, not everybody felt the need to respond in this way, but it is still quite key that what I want to sh basically show through these sequence of figures is that there is a variation in practice across England. And if we have a variation in practice, that's quite key because our historic environment record is effectively informed by the conclusions of our evaluations. Uh, you know, uh, and our archaeological record is informed by how well we're prospecting um, when these developments happen. And uh, I, I think Sandy said it earlier, but I'm not sure, uh, or perhaps somebody else did, but um, you know, 
if we, I think it perhaps um, was you, Kate, but saying if we have different techniques, um, you know, what are these techniques, uh, you know, what are the questions that we need to equip for these techniques? Because these techniques might be doing different, um, showing different things. So if we're using different techniques in different areas, we, we might actually have um, perhaps differences in how we're seeing the archaeological record in, um, in different areas, which is absolutely fine when you have a wide um, specialist base and specialist knowledge. But when it's put into something more general like the HER, if these sites have been found in different ways, and then they're put together, um, you know, can they be compared in the same way? So just quickly on urban evaluation, you know, kind of these the, a big inverted commas norm. Uh, one of the things that there wasn't so, so much um, a normal case of laying out trenches, and there were ma many, many more factors in evaluating urban sites. Um, for example, the layout of, uh, you know, the, the logistics of the site, uh, you know, the restrictions and the health and safety. Um, and often it was found that uh, uh, perhaps going straight to strip map or a, a higher um, sampling uh, area was uh, very useful. Also with more industrial archeology span and um, uh, the historic old maps and historic environment was often are uh, used to um, target areas because the question became different often in urban environments where the question stopped being so much about this detection that we see at the beginning of PPG 16, uh, this whole new world as uh, Sandy was saying, where suddenly the archeological question changes from uh, let's look at this area and you know, find out more with a more targeted evaluation to looking at development areas where we don't know so much about the area at all. You know, we're not picking the area, but we're surveying it for archaeology. But in urban areas, we often do have a lot clearer information. And so with an industrial site where you perhaps have a factory, um, you might not be very interested in sampling, you know, the factory floor but you'd be much more interested in using the plants to try to identify the engine room to see if it's the kind of um, uh, heritage that uh, would be interest for your region or something like that. So there seemed to be more, um, it, 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 uh, urban evaluation seemed to even have even less rules of thumb. Um, so perhaps not very helpful. Another quickly going through, um, most people talked about field walking, um, but, with time and the environment, uh, it's not always possible because it's highly seasonal and uh, you might have to have a window. So working with developers in this way might be difficult. Um, some people talked about LIDAR, ground penetrating radar, metal detecting was brought up. And you know, going back to some of the talks this morning, it seems to be um, becoming more and more a very useful evaluation technique. Borehole surveys and then um, deposit modeling and uh, you know, creating predictive models seems to be a very useful way of evaluating um, our landscape. But what I, you know, what I'm supposed saying is, is our most common techniques, which we still use in this country, are evaluation trenching covering a large area, and and often the other techniques are used with evaluation trenching. So we still need to understand the risks associated with evaluation trenching. And this is, I suppose, where my work comes in, where, um, uh, uh, and, uh, yeah, of evaluating our present techniques. And so one of the problems, I suppose, with evaluation trenching is it is often only done once. Um, so you don't really see what you're missing. Uh, Thomas and Darville had a paper out recently about the, um, uh, the usefulness of negative data in development archaeology's uh, conclusions and the fact that we have these very large data sets which are now show we can now start to wonder you know about these blank areas and things like this but actually um, we've got to be quite cautious with this um, these conclusions because how blank are our blank areas because if we trench an area say at two to five percent 
And from these conclusions, we then make a, um, an idea about where our archaeology is and what um, our mitigation area will be, or if we will have a mitigation area. Uh, we don't actually see these areas which we've decided are blank. And we don't test um, so often uh, how well um, we'll see, uh, how, 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 how negative are our negatives. So in that aim, my work tried to look at um, modeling very simplified sites and different trenching layouts and, and sampling strategies to look at what we potentially might be missing. This looks at, my work looks at um, hypothetical data, data at first, creating effectively shapes, long, um, larger, smaller um, shapes of different types and see and looks at how well they're found and then also inputs um, archaeological site plans. Here are some of the uh, um, trenching layouts that I had a look at. Um, uh, standard grid and herringbone are used in the UK a fair amount. Um, continuous trenching is used uh, on, in mainland Europe a lot, uh, certainly in France and um, Flanders. And although we do lay out trenches with prior knowledge, uh, uh, the study done in Worcestershire found that we, there is often some sort of grid pattern. And um, also there's, there's not necessarily a huge difference in, in detection conclusions between laying out with a prior knowledge and with, um, uh, with a grid. And what we, what this computer, this huge simplification of an archaeological evaluation assumes is lack of prior knowledge. Um, but what, what I'm able to do with this hypothetical site is trench over these different coverages. Here's a grid layout at one to 15%. And then see the known population of the site. So we have what the whole site, and we can see what we're potentially missing. So as I said earlier, the site was divided up into um, lo um, long to represent ditches, large to represent you know, buildings, and small to represent pit, uh, you know, post hole features, more discrete features like hearths, um, to get, get an idea of how these different types of features might be sampled and be seen in our evaluation sample. Um, this is a real uh, simplification of archaeological sites, but um, yeah, th this is the simplification. And I also, um, you know, in these simplifications, try to represent period by having different abundances of these four types of features. So we have type one, type two, type three, type four. Also, another thing that this study aimed to look at and does much more by using real site data, but to begin with looked at um, uh, how the archaeology on a site may affect um, the evaluation sample. So here we have low density, and then we have where the archaeology is more centered, and then uh, a random layout. And this went from 121 features, all these hypothetical sites at the bottom have 121 features, or varying small, medium, and large with these four different types to um, 2,420 features at the top. And this gives us an idea of how density might affect our evaluation sample and how we might in the field be potentially biasing, well, what we might be detecting. And another caveat um, to say about this model is that the model assumes 100% detection with a trench intersecting a feature, which is by no means the case, but has been somewhat covered by previous studies looking at the effectiveness of trenching, uh, such as uh, Ruth Waller's PhD in 2008, which compared mitigation data and um, the previous evaluation prediction and looked at how well um, these, how well evaluation was likely to find certain types of features based on what we'd done. I tried to shy away from that because I didn't want to make a judgment call on um, how well the archaeology would be undertaken. And uh, that is perhaps an area for further research. But this almost assumes a best case scenario of 100% uh, identification uh, by a trench. 
when the trench intersects the feature. But keep in mind that this is not the case. They're not, not, not necessarily the case. So. Um, so just to quickly go through some of these, I'm gonna now, now I'm gonna talk about um, some of my uh, early um, data, which is currently being written up as a paper for archeological prospection. So um, people should be able to read that hopefully in the near future. But to, to, under, to understand these results. So what we see here is if we go, if you keep in mind, th this is a hypothetical site so I was talking about. So we have nine hypothetical sites. And if we go to this graph, what we're seeing here is we have 16 graphs um, and uh, you have the, um, sorry, 18 graphs um, going around. Uh, and what you have is each one corresponds to one of the sites. So we have the uniform high density, medium density, low density, and this is the number of features detected. And this is the area of features detected. And one of the things that by using a computer model we were able to do is repeat these evaluations over and over again with different angles and different layouts and different positions. So we get to an idea of a variability within our evaluation sample and you know what is what are the potential ways of doing it if we did it twice are we getting different results and so each bar corresponds to 800 different simulations of that trenching layout so this bar here at the bottom at one percent is one percent trenching over a uniform low density site of this hypothetical site and how many features are found. The features, the results are shown as a percentage of the total features on site. So it's how well, in, in, in this graph, how well are our features reflecting or sampling the site population. And on the right, these blue graphs is the same detection, but by area of feature. So this is area of total features across the nine sites, and this is number of total features across the nine sites. And so from this, we can see that you get higher detection with higher um, sampling. And we also have greater variability, um, much greater variability when we have lower density sites. So there we are. Um, this is the same graph I just showed you, but as um, you know, the key takeaway from this simplistic model is that um, as detection increases, uh, detection increases as coverage of trenches increases, which is something to keep in mind because we have different coverages of trenches. I'm, I want to. Uh, I'm, I'm going to present the results and then I'm going to talk about perhaps what this means later, because I don't think this is uh, necessarily the helpful way we want to go forward. We don't necessarily want more detection. There's a certain amount we need, and it's for us to make this decision of what risk is acceptable and. Um, how, you know, how much information is enough, but that's a, perhaps a question for a further time. But a key thing that we found when we look at, if we look at the um, uh, features detected when broken down into the type of features, which I showed earlier, so the, the long and large features are overrepresented in our sample, while the small features are underrepresented. So this, um, graph shows the long features detected uh, in all the hypothetical sites. Uh, this is with this, uh, I'm sorry to count here, this is just the standard grid trenching layout that I've shown you. I'm only going to be doing the standard grid because we don't have quite enough time to go through everything. But we're seeing uh, similar results with the different layouts is actually we have uh, a very high detection rate of our long features. And these, are, and these are just the hypothetical you know, 30 meter long um, rectangles, but on, on um, real site data with much longer ditches, we're seeing a, a high, a even higher detection rates. And this is in the number of features in our evaluation sample uh, compared to the um, site population. So we're actually seeing, you know, even at the low trenching densities, you know, about you know, here at 2%, which is at our 
the end of you know, the lower end of our practice, we're seeing 20% of our long features uh, uh, detected in our evaluation sample. And although we get a large amount of variation with the, um, with the sparse density sites, with the low density sites, we're actually seeing that you're often having a lot of um, high number of features detected. And then area perhaps is a better indicator of how well, um, how reflective uh, your sample is. Another way of looking at these results, rather than just saying we found 20% of the ditches or we found 20% of the um, your pits on the site, is looking at uh, these results as a um, proportion of the sample. So, and how, how that differs from how the total features, the proportion of the total features on site. So this, what these graphs show is the same data, but if, for example, 20% uh, of your features on site were ditches and 30% of your sample features were ditches, this graph would have a mark on 10 because you're 10 above uh, you know, how reflective you are of the site sample. And here we see that actually, again, with the long features, we have an, usually an over-representation of um, your site with a high amount with, of, the, of the proportions of your site with a high amount of variability at the lower um, coverages of trenching. Likewise seen in area, but less of an over-representation. So you have more less variable results with a higher percentage coverage. Again, how much variability is acceptable? How, how accurate do we need our diagnosis is to be in evaluation is a question for further time. Likewise, we see how small features um, are much less, yeah, although we see that their detection increases with coverage, we see that there's not the same fly up with as with long features, such as ditches. And then again, if we look at these small features as a proportion, we actually see a underrepresentation in our sample. Also, if we looked at rarity, so um, the, uh, on this sparse density site, our type four, which are our rare features, made to represent rare features or rare periods of, on site, we see a much greater variation. And we, um, we often, at the lower percentages, often see them being missed. This rather erratic graph uh, is because there is only four features um, uh, on the site of type four. So we see, actually, when you have a very low amount, you really might be missing them a lot of the time, even with the um, with your uh, high high coverages of trenching. And all this is fine, but it's about understanding the risks associate, associated with our sampling methods, which we use to make conclusions. But you know, if potentially you have four beaker graves across your site, you still want to hit that significant archaeology. Effectively, we you know, we we if we're um, you know, we, we are affected by the um, archaeology on site. But we, uh, to, just to sum up this you know, portion, uh, we do have a higher chance of um, having false negative conclusions with our rarer, smaller features, and we're much likely to find our larger, longer features. So, you know, does that mean when thinking about that, um, uh, the graph that Sandy showed where we have the um, periods uh, and the types of the monuments in the historic environment record, are we, you know, do we, are the types of features that we have in our historic environment record, are they because we're better at finding the larger medieval, you know, Roman uh, type sites, and are we worse at finding our smaller Neolithic 
um, more discrete types of archaeology. For ex and this is, I I've taken a rather brute force approach to this, I realise um, now coming to the end of my research of, you know, throwing these different simulations again and again with different sites and seeing what they'd find. But this has been approached in a number of different ways. And uh, for example, in Flanders, uh, de Klerk, I think it was, did a study looking at how there were less Saxon or were early medieval sites found after the introduction of um, uh, development-led archaeology, because as you standardize techniques, some techniques are better for others. And it's keeping these things in mind, keeping in mind what we're looking for and having this um, you know, nuanced approach of different techniques and not throwing the baby out with the bathwater in, in the sense that trenching does seem to work very well and has high detection rates, but it's understanding what it might be better at finding and what it might not be so good at finding. Um, and as I said earlier, um, a lot of this, you know, this kind of highly simplified computer models are showing um, you know, the strength of different detection and coverage becoming a key thing. But actually, I think it raises a more interesting question, which is how much information do we need about a site to make the next, um, uh, to make the decisions for the next stage? And how much risk are we willing to accept and each um, partner in development uh, willing to accept? You know, are we willing to accept that 50% of the time we miss our rare features or do we need it to be 80? You know, uh, uh, what, what uh, 80 percent time we're finding them? Or, you know, it is, is the developer willing to pay for, you know, for, for these different, um, you know, certainties? And can we actually get a certainty, certainly with very sparse um, archaeological populations? Um, but as, as Sandy was identifying, that there isn't actually area, there isn't really blank areas. But with the sparse areas, we might have to accept that we're unlikely to um, detect the archaeology, even with a high percentage of trenching, as seen in um, this graph, yeah, these graphs here, that actually you're often, you're really not likely to find them, or you have such a high variation in your results that, um, it, you know, can you be, it, it, how accurate are your conclusions? And the next stage is um, uh, actually came about from work with C, uh, speaking at the CIFA conference in spring, is comparing different environments and um, the, re the results, uh, sorry, Comparing different environments across uh, both HS2 and the A14, uh, comparing the interpretations on, of geophysical survey and the interpretations of evaluation trenching uh, against the subsequent mitigation conclusions to have a look at how accurate these two techniques are. And the reason this was felt to be useful was because although they, these are two techniques which very much do different things and often used together, um, if we have an understanding of how well these techniques work in different environments, we can perhaps provide some quantitative data which would help them be deployed better and make justifications to um, developers and for using these techniques in different ways rather than having trenching laying out across um, an area where there's a acceptable geophysical survey um, and, and, um, and where that trenching could perhaps be used in a different area, perhaps an area where geophysical survey isn't working so well. But this is meant to be a very much a pilot study. The way that it's work is um, three of the mitigation areas from the A14 and 17 from HS2 are used and uh, a model has been built which looks at how accurate the um, conclusions of the trenching and the um, uh, geophysical survey is against the subsequent mitigation data. And we can then see um, how well they're doing. And it's a different way to assess our evaluation techniques. 
Um, but sadly, the case study is not quite as large as um, I would like as I'm coming to the end of my project. But um, sorry, that, that, that's, uh, that's where I've kind of come to my end. Uh, if there's any questions, that will probably help to um, hone down what I realise might have been quite a ramble. Thanks. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, and again, a huge amount of data in, in there. And you mentioned um, that there's a paper to be published um, shortly, so we can we can sign post um, people to that as well. It's a lot, a lot of uh, data I'd say, to, to take in in a, a relatively short space of time. But we do we do have a little bit of time um, for questions um, if we have any. Um, just remind us where the paper's being published, Lucy Parker is asking. Uh, it, well, it's, 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 not, uh, it's currently uh, being submitted, but it's to archaeological prospection, uh, is the hope. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so we've got a question in the chat from Jonathan Last, um, who is asking, in your survey, did you establish how widespread is systematic cow soil bucket or test pit sampling during trial trench evaluation sorry i'm reading this and the screen's moving as, as other people are, are posting as practice how, how often people um uh, how, how how often there was uh sieving of the uh is that right yeah sieving of samples from plow soil um actually that was um that that was something which was um widely used and something which seemed to be coming in much more again i think after doing this um, rather informal uh, data gathering for myself is something that uh, I think would be very useful for um, uh, perhaps Al Ageo to do, because one of the key things was there was a lot of um, you know, advisors who didn't perhaps know what was going on in different counties um, or and you know, which perhaps could be frustrating for developers as well, or, or give developers a different uh, 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 annoyance because people were recommending in different ways. Not that that's a bad thing, because of course, um, each area should be a, a specialist recommendation, but uh, it, I, I, I will have to go through the results, but it was fairly well recommended, but again, differed from area to area. And there were all, one of the key things to note was there were also different challenges faced by different areas, sometimes to, to do with wealth and sometimes to do with um, where the advisor sat in the um, uh, planning authority yeah, and things like that. Um, and yeah, it certainly struck me that, as you mentioned, opportunities for field walking are becoming more restricted because of agricultural intensification, et cetera. Um, and this seems to be one way of kind of examining the plow zone um, in the, uh, you know, during the stage of evaluation. But I do wonder how effective it is compared to, say, field walking. Oh, yeah, yeah, no. Um, yeah, I think uh, also it's one of those interesting areas which I would, it would be interesting to explore more and more. But these, these techniques, which perhaps are more clued up to different areas and for, you know for example looking at the top soil you're perhaps more likely to find your mesolithic um your, your, your flint scatters and yeah. and you know how often is it that when you look you find and uh having an idea of these when these techniques are employed um for example this morning i we were hearing about metal detecting um being uh, being used and um uh, on, on sites and some sites finding more metal when a metal detectorist um, is employed. This is this is key because it means we're really biasing our finds um, and our understanding of the record by, by how we're looking at looking for it and at it. Um, but yeah, yeah so I, th I think um, sieving of, of um, spoil and sieving of trenching is, is a key thing to do to move forward yeah. or, or to understand about how everybody else is doing it. Thanks, Richard. We're, we're, we're rapidly running out of time for this, this session. If there are any um, burning questions, we could just squeeze them in. Um, 
There are lots of really interesting and useful comments in the chat, but I think they're comments and observations rather than direct questions. So we'll we'll, we'll perhaps try and capture that and share that um, share that with you. I don't know if there's anything there that you want to to particularly um, respond to, Richard. Um, yeah, uh, Richard Hughes's. Uh, I mean, I, I I haven't been able to read them all, but I just read Richard Hughes's. Um, I think that that's a key point as well, which again, I feel that my study has done almost the bare minimum of even looking at what an evaluation requires, which is detection, but actually evaluation is much more complex than that. And if we're looking at the aims of uh, you know, what, what we're talking about this morning and, and how, if, if, if the aim is to inform the HER or if the aim is to you know, publish, there might be different things, or, if it's just for the preservation of archaeology, actually, you know, the timing and uh, basically getting as many techniques in as possible uh, is, is very key. And I think that would be a, a key thing to look at is how well, um, and originally my project was trying to look at this, is looking at how we could perhaps use deposit modeling and how, uh, to inform trenching in different environments. And I think some people have done uh, a little bit of work on that, Clive Waddington and David Knight making assessments that that's just off the top of my head of how well a landscape, you know, how, how well you might ex expect different techniques to work in different parts of a landscape. But I think, again, uh, a really interesting thing for everybody to have would be a more specified study on how these recommendations are made, because there's a lot of untapped knowledge, often based on landscapes, often based, you know, including time scales, you know, uh, financial factors, uh, you know, how well these specific techniques, which are often advised on based on smaller uh, studies done in one area, are informed across the country and why they work. And I think, um, I think that would be very interesting for everybody, uh, especially the practitioners, to see how well um, not only are, are these different techniques being used, but uh, how well these different techniques can potentially be used, but how they are actually applied and how the people who are recommending them uh, find that they work. Um, at, at, you know, yeah, and you could also include costs and things with that. And I think that would be quite an interesting map to have. But yeah, timing um, does does seem to be a very important factor. Sadly, I haven't been able to integrate it as much as I'd like into my study. Brilliant, thanks, thanks, Richard. And just remind us again, you, you mentioned that you're coming to the end of your research. Um, when 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 are you hoping to? Uh, um, to well, yeah, it, it definitely ends in March, but I'm hoping to end a little bit before. So yeah, at the beginning of next year, um, look out for a PhD, hopefully. Thanks. Thank you for that. We certainly will. And 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 also in terms of, um, we've not had time really to sort of touch on the the Evals One project that was that was really looking at, at the the understanding of current practice um, and has been designed to um, uh, to be complementary to the the research that you're doing and then and then potentially looking at a follow on project once your the PhD research is, is complete and, and published that we can that we can then sort of take that on to the next stage so that that will also be in the pipeline. Um, sadly we've run out of time um, in this session so I'd like to just thank you again Richard and to Sandy um, for contributing and to, for our contributors this morning um, talking about metal detecting techniques. If you're not all completely innovated out we do have a, a final um, wrap-up Tea break session at three o'clock um, where we'll be looking at trying to draw some of the threads together from across the week and um, thinking about how we can um, encourage innovative practice and break down some of the barriers to, to um, being more innovative in, in our approaches. So please do come back if you can and join us for that. But otherwise, thank you very much everyone for your contributions. Um, go and have a well and cup of tea and hopefully we'll see some of you back at, at three o'clock. Thanks very much everyone.